and welcome to a special panel discussion in observance of St. Lucia's 42nd anniversary of independence. I am Lisa Joseph, serving as your moderator. We're looking at the topic, Were You There? A look back at the fight for independence. We're looking at the political landscape in St. Lucia during the period 1979 to 1982. The desire for independence and the influence of regional political turmoil on local affairs. Despite his personal standing in Miku, however, Compton's government had barely survived the 1974 general elections. His United Workers Party had scraped through, which was to Compton, who had grown accustomed to having his way in the House, thanks to a largely unrepresented opposition, as hard to swallow as actual defeat. Months after the highly controversial elections, several charges of fraud had to be settled in court. The Labour Party's George Odlum and Peter Josie were carrying on as if indeed they were still election candidates on the campaign trail. Hardly a day passed without a charge of corruption against Compton. One evening, Odlum and Josie led an angry demonstration to Premier Compton's official residence. Compton was not at home and his pregnant wife, scared out of her wits for her own life and the lives of her two young children, was forced to depend for protection on the unarmed policeman outside her front gates. Fortunately, armed reinforcements arrived in time to avert grievous bodily harm. When Compton talked about retirement, however, his reasons never had anything to do with his personal safety or that of his family. Once, after a friend had asked him why he continued to engage Odlam and Josie, in what the friend secretly suspected was a losing battle, the premier had said, quote, St. Lucia is like a delicate little flower. A strong wind could blow us to kingdom come, end quote. Therefore, it was imperative that Compton's little flower be kept out of the hands of foolish virgins who are experts at sprouting communist mumbo-jumbo and creating upheaval, but could not be trusted to do anything constructive for the island's 120,000 population. That was an excerpt from Foolish Virgins by Rick Wayne, which now leads me to introduce our guest, Rick Wayne, writer and journalist, and Peter Josie, former politician. Gentlemen, welcome. Let me just say that we will be using Foolish Virgins by Rick Wayne as much of the basis for our discussion here on this panel. And of course, later on in the discussion, Shattered Dreams by Peter Josie will feature in the sort of uh, post-independence discussion. We'll also be hearing from Sir John in his own words, a documentary that airs here on the GIS as well as going back into the National Archives, looking at some newspaper clippings, and we've certainly seen documentary by the GIS Library that will be forming the basis of our discussion. Now, we, let's talk about the 1979 period and perhaps looking at some of the issues that are brought, led us to 79. Um, to the year of our independence. Let's invite first Rick. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate in this panel discussion. I am reading the book Foolish Virgins. It gave me the impression that you were the fly on the wall in just about every scene in this book. And so I would like to ask, were you indeed that fly on the wall? Well, um, let me say first of all, this, this thing about the foolish virgins, I said, that's a quota. Um, it, it, should, it, should be to, it should be told that those were not my lines. They were, they, I think they were in coach. They were Compton's lines. Um, I, wasn't, I suppose I was a fly on a wall, but it wasn't a fly that was kind of invisible. I was a journalist, and everybody knew that's what I was doing. I, so I was, I was very involved. That's the kind of journalist that I am. Um, but I was reporting primarily for newspapers. It hadn't entered my mind I was doing a book. That came much later on. So all of, the, all of those things in the book um, were taken from 
stories written one day and published the next. So the, the, the pride is that all those things were there, hardly disputed to any great extent anyway. So but it wasn't just a fly on the wall, it was a journalist at work. Okay. Peter Josie, thank you so much for agreeing and participating. Uh, for you, I, I get the sense that you are in a position at this time in your life to not just reflect on those years, but also uh, how your actions at that time shaped the political landscape for St. Lucia. Um, your thoughts on that period leading up to 1979? Um, thank you, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. And I'm, in fact, even happier that Rick is here. Because I've read Foolish Virgins a couple times. And I have to say I'm so happy that God has blessed my life to permit me to be around today when I'm writing my autobiography. Because there are things that are reported here about me that needs to be corrected because they are not exactly how it happened. I accept a lot of it is, is factual. In fact, I am to review my position right now is to review all the things that had been written about me. Because for some reason, I believe I was a threat in people's minds to the society. Um, I'm not prepared to go into why they think so. They have written, and those who want to um, read, to know, can go and look back at history. But I'm very happy to be here, and I'm even happier that I was part of everything that happened leading to the independence of St. Lucia. And later on, because we have some time, I will explain why is it I believe if the contribution of people like myself and Odom and the Labour Party were followed in that time, we would have had a better constitution in St. Lucia today and maybe in a better place today. So I'm very, very happy because I will not allow, not allow history to record and see me as some people may have wanted me to be seen or as they recorded it, as they understood it. Might very well be innocent, um, an innocent observation. And it's interesting, although I'm, I'm not jealous, it's very interesting that you use foolish virgins to introduce this. When I was the candidate, I was the one who went to London all three times, and Rick was just a journalist. And I say just a journalist because journalists can have sides too. You see the point I'm making? But I'll not hold it against you, Lisa. I've, I've known you long enough, so I'll let that pass, okay? Well, I thank you for not holding it <laughs> against me, but this is why you are here, so that you will be able to place us there through your eyes as only you can. Trust me, I will do that. I will do that. We're going to set the scene first by uh, hearing from the late Sir John Compton, and he speaks about a regional approach to independence. Let's go to that clip from the documentary in his own words, and then we'll be able to get some feedback. I started off with coming back from England and opposition to colonialism and the countries must be independent. When we talk about independence in those days, we didn't speak about St. Lucia as an independent country. We spoke about St. Lucia within the Caribbean Federation. That was the big talk, Federation. Federation phase. Then we tried with the uh, Associated States, as they call them, hoping to get them closer together. We couldn't get that. We tried the Windward Islands. And while we were negotiating the Windward Islands, that's its coming, uh, coming in, into 1974. While we were negotiating for the Windward Islands to come together, and the first we start, let's say, with freedom of movement, freedom to work from work permits, freedom to own land, etc., etc. While we're talking about that, Grenada went behind our backs and negotiated with the government, with the British government, for independence. And they gave them the independence, despite all the violence and all of this in Grenada. Uh, they gave them the independence. <coughs> so, what else? 
the next thing we hear, who is talking about independence? Dominica. Dominica is going independent. So what are we to do? Wait. So we, in 1974, we, we had elections in 74, which we won. Our program there, our political program was that together, if we can, alone if we must. So by 1974, it was alone because it must. So John comes in there speaking about that period. Perhaps we could go back to, to Peter. Your thoughts in hearing Sir John there speak about what should have been that regional approach, that collaborative stance when it came to independence. But you found that the islands were going it alone. And so he found that Senusha too had to go it alone. And what about the thought about independence made you so opposed to it, Peter? Before we get to my opposition, it's very important when you speak, and by you I don't mean you personally, when politicians, especially public people, speak to understand what they are living out as opposed to the words <laughs> they are speaking. After Federation failed, Sally Lewis, Sir Arthur Lewis, sorry, Sir Arthur Lewis, the Nobel laureate, first St. Lucia Nobel laureate, wrote a concise um, recommendation on a smaller federation, which he called the Little Eight Federation, mm -hmm. with Barbados, the Windward and Leeward Islands. And the most important thing that happened there is before this thing had taken root, Mr. Um, Buske, J.M.D. Buske, who was a minister in the Compton government at the time, went, was in parliament, and took that paper from Sir, Ali Lu Sir Arthur Lewis and tore it in parliament. What did that mean? It means that St. Lucia was not interested. Sir John Compton, well, Com John Compton at the time, must have known <laughs> that that is what would happen. So the little eight did not even have a beginning. There was no birth. Then after that, there was some talk, I mean, to pacify themselves, you know, and, and by themselves, I mean the government of St. Lucia, they made, made it look as if they were interested in the Windward Islands without Barbados. Barbados has been so far ahead economically at the time and still is um, in almost every aspect of life in a developing country that I did not foresee how these Windward and Leeward Islands could function and survive without having Barbados included. Plus Barbados was the favorite island of all the developed countries, including the British. The policemen, civil servants, all the key things, all the ambassadorial things that up after independence, up to today, the, the regional security system, almost everything is based in Barbados. What do you think would have been behind that before Rick chimes in? I guess they probably knew that maybe Grenada wanted to go alone because it's a small region. Um, Gary was um, fairly popular, but there was a lot of machinations going on. There were a lot of um, influential rich people behind Gary, a lot of millionaires. I guess they wanted Grenada for themselves. So when Barbados failed, or, or maybe they thought Barbados was too far ahead of them, and, and too disciplined and too correct. So they prefer the Windward Islands. Hopefully, I don't know if that was the thinking, maybe St. Lucia thought it was in a better position to be the capital of the Windward and Leeward Islands. Mm -hmm. All of this could have come in, in, in the reckoning. Rick? Interestingly, um, I wish I'd brought it. Um, so Arthur Lewis goes into, into detail as to what he expect, why the Federation failed and what he hoped would happen. And he, he also said that um, the, the, the islands would come together, the region would come together, but only after the passing of the then um, prime ministers and, or, or, or premiers or whatever. Of course, that still hasn't happened. Compton also seemed to have had uh, a concern with what that he called sharks and sardines and St. Lucia, St. Lucia, he, in fact, sardines didn't swim with sharks. 
That was a, com a Compton attitude. Mm -hmm. But what I find is um, especially, because this is a little bo um, before my time journalistically, um, what I find interesting, uh, bearing in mind what, what happened later on and Compton's um, expressions later on, because he did finally say independence was a misnomer. He said so at the Central Library, that Britain couldn't, could hardly wait to cut us off, that Britain had carried us as a, col as a colony, that Britain we had gone through associated statehood, all in preparation for Britain cutting us off. So it wasn't really independence. So it's, an, it's a very interesting situation where you had one side speaking against independence, with all, all, all that surrounded it, and the other side pro-independence, when in fact there was no independence. In reality, it was uh, Britain deciding I've had enough of, of, of feeding those, those, those sardines, let them go swim on their own. So it's a little bit, dis not disturbing, but interesting to me to hear um, John Compton saying in that clip that um, about the possibility of independence en masse. <laughs> I don't know how he could even talk about that. Um, wh where would the control be? You know, he, he could only speak for St. Lucia and from negotiations with others, maybe they would, they would agree to that, but that had nothing to do with him. In any event, it's cancelled out mm -hmm. by his final statement that there really was no independence on the table, that it was a, a we're cutting you off. Children, you've grown up now, we've fed you enough, go take care of yourself. But if that's the case, uh, Peter, and I saw you nodding as Rick was speaking, mm -hmm. so you too understood that Britain was ready to sort of, quote-unquote, dispose of, of, of St. Lucia um, after having carried it for so long. So where, what was the crux of your opposition and members of, of is the St. Lucia Forum? Yeah. Uh, what was the crux of that it opposition? It was very simple. It's, uh, we, we thought, and I've said so in my opening statement, I still believe that independence is about the constitution that you have to guide you. This is the, the key factor. And that the people of St. Lucia, although people said otherwise, in the 1974 elections were not consulted. We are talking now, from what you said, between 79 and 82. Really, and I, I think um, you, you, you understand that as well, it started from 74. Because it was after the 74 elections, and in 1977, in fact from 1966, the Compton administration had written to the British government so seeking independence. But Rick is also right. The United Nations had a, a group of 24 that were demanding independence for all colonies everywhere in the world. And I don't believe that um, group of 24 came about without the nod of people like England and France and, and those countries that had a lot of colonies. So it was, it was a plot. It was a plot to get rid of all those islands. They had become baggage. And so we needed to get rid of all these islands. And, and the group of 24 at the United Nations was a very convenient tool, you know, for both the developed mother colony, quote unquote, mother is in quotes, and the, 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 the colonial territory itself, to say, ah, this is our moment. England, you have to give us independence. That is what the international people want. St. Lucia, you have to be ready. Ready or not, independence is coming. And we in the opposition at the time, in fact, from Forum, we are talking about independence because we felt that we couldn't take this country anywhere, either alone or as a group, if they were not independent. So there are people who try to, 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 to say otherwise, but the facts are there. So you were pro-independence? Even before Compton had mentioned it, from the forum. But they were afraid that what we are talking about, if we became independent, and that is a term I love to use up to now, we had to militarize the society for young people to have military discipline. What does that mean? It because may why? because reading, reading through Foolish Virgins, there was a lot of apprehension about that sort of uh, military precisely, presence precisely. in St. Lucia. And that's why I mention it again today. You cannot develop a country without your, without your youth being trained to defend the country, to work for the country. When you reach Form 5, either 16, 17, whatever age, 
you should be registered as a voluntary youth worker for the country. On Saturdays, when you have free time, you begin, or your name is registered everywhere um, in the government service. But you would admit, though, Peter, that at the time, looking at the time period that we were in, and given all that was taking given, place... Given Fidel Castro and Cuba. And, and Cuba and Grenada, the, the events happening in Grenada as well, that when you speak about uh, whether the, the military, military, military discipline, military discipline um, the, the signing up of, of, of youngsters, people yeah. immediately associated that with communism. Yeah, but, but, but why? Why? They have not read the history of America to know how America was transformed. What is the name of that president, Rick, who began the, the work thing in the United States when they had the Depression? Even President Kennedy, JFK, what did he do? The young Americans were graduating, what did he do? He started the Peace Corps movement where young Americans were trained and were working all over the world voluntarily. Let's get Rick to chime in here because Peter is speaking about that time. I saw you nodding. Um, and as I was saying to him, the idea of that military discipline that he's speaking of. Did St. Lucia at the time, because Peter is very firm in his mind that yes, they were for the in for independence. They had a particular method that they wanted to apply to St. Lucia. Were St. Lucians very, uh, how should I put it, were they quote unquote okay with what it is that the St. Lucia Forum was uh, pushing at the time, Rick? Uh, 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 let, let, me, let me say this. We're talking about independence. We're talking about an independence that was not an independence. It was, that was fake. It was put by both sides to the people, and both sides gave their promoting points. The, you know, the, the, if, if the Labour Party or whatever the group was, Peter and so on, so was, were, were against whatever Compton was talking about in terms of, of independence. They, they, the matter of communism, that, that was never worked. there was never any communism in St. Lucia. Thank you, Rick. Com the guy's communism was a bogeyman. Thank you, And Rick. so for election purposes, from the, t from the days of, 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 of Peter Josie and, and George in, in, um, in the forum, were called communists. It, 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 it didn't take any, it didn't require any explaining. People were not interested in an explanation. There was nothing about militarizing anything. Communism was the devil. And so Compton presented, painted those guys as the devil who were against independence. But again, the people took it in the neck because there really was no independence on the table. It was a cutting away, a cutting off of, of, the, of, 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 of load, of, of, of baggage. So the reality, as now, was seldom ever discussed on the road to independence. The independence itself became a political football. One side was against it, so they said whatever they needed to say and do, against it. Just like now. But independence was... Um, <laughs> was the day's DSH, I suppose. You know, that's what it was. There were, independence was never really on the table. The people were conned. And Compton admitted that later on. But I have to say, George, Peter, and them also conned the people. Because they didn't tell them, they know the independence here. Britain wants to cut us off. Whether we liked it or not, Rick, the point is that a group of 24 at the United Nations yeah. had mandated the, 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 the thing we call independence. So we had to play along, whether it was fakery or not. Yep. It's, it's not material. It was not material at the time. Mm -hmm. Because if we did not go, then England and would give John Compton and Henry Girodi, who went with him, and Parry Husbands. These were the three guys. Parry was the, the Attorney General. Henry was Chairman of the um, UWP. They would have gotten all what they wanted in the Constitution without an input from the opposition. You see the point I'm making? Once you were in England, Peter, did you find that you had, you and your, your other members, had a firm uh, input into what the Constitution would turn out to be? I would say on some of, the, some of the clauses in the Constitution, like the preamble especially, but the British were all up to it. Um, although, I have to tell you, those areas that we in the opposition were particularly interested in, like term limits for the prime minister. You watching, were you there? A look back at the fight for independence. Stay with us.
Do you know we can limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus? The Ministry of Health is your partner in achieving this solution. Introducing the Amber Wristwatch. The Amber Wristwatch is designed for monitoring daily movements while in quarantine. It provides an accurate location and a precise heart rate. The device is also waterproof and can be worn during all daily functions, like washing the dishes or taking a shower. It's worn like a typical timepiece. The Ministry of Health can now better monitor people in home quarantine and receive alerts of those who do not stay in the confines of their home. A 14-day rental of the Amber wristwatch is just 75 US dollars. Let us stop the breaches of home quarantine. And welcome back to our special discussion, Were You There? A look back at the fight for independence. Before we went to break, Rick, you were chiming in on what Peter left us off on. Now, to take on some of what Peter was saying there, also, again, we're talking about something that has never existed, that, that had no existence, that still has no existence, and it really is something of a fast in all ways. Why is it that after all this time of quote-unquote independence, we still have done nothing, no serious discussion, no referendum about term limits? What is stopping us in all those years since 79, if we were so interested in term limits during the discussions in London and so on, why has that never been approached in any serious way here? The independence. All the things that Peter just talked about that they might have wanted in the Constitution or whatever, we have had ample time to have done that. And Peter had been in government, Compton was in, was in government, and all, and all those things. And we are, more, to finally, more than ever dependent on the, uh, the charity of strangers. We're more than ever dependent, and it, it, to bring it up, vaccine, we're dead without the strangers helping us out with that. This whole thing about the Prime Minister said about colonization, we're dead without, without colonials. We, we, we are as dependent on England and, and the United States as ever we were. And there are people old enough in this country to even suggest that we were better off under the colonials. The myth of we were free, and Compton you talk about as well, yeah, free to serve, free to not work, free to be a bum. Freedom is supposed to open up, give you all the, um, the liberty to pursue the stars, you know, to pursue greatness. We've not done that, to my mind, and I think this is such a fantastic opportunity to say we have regressed in, the, in, in, in all the important areas. We've regressed. And our minds have been filled today, not with communism, but with racist notions, even though we cannot survive without the great assistance of the very people against whom we want to practice our, if only, mental racism. Let's go to the scene of London, because before we took the break, till Peter will get a chance for us to expand on that. An excerpt again from Foolish Virgins. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, that's okay. At a special meeting in London, opposition leader Alan Louise had argued for a definite postponement of Com Compton's independence plans. To no avail, plagued by his own social and economic woes, the British government seemed to have heirs only for Senusha's premier, who was soon crowing on local television and over government-controlled radio that come February 22, 1979, Senusha would be an independent nation with its very own place at the United Nations General Assembly. Free at last! In retaliation, George Odlum issued a public warning that come Independence Day, Senusha might not be the safest place in the world. Peter, your recollections on, on that? Because if we're saying that there was no independence to gain, uh, there was the argument for the postponement of that independence, which in effect we have said was a farce. Because they were well, pretending there was independence. Let me take it from where Rick left off. Because sometimes 
the facts are looking at you in the face and it is so obvious that the only people who will not see it are those who do not want to see. The colonial office, and Rick is correct, there was independence, but at the same time, they didn't free the islands completely. <laughs> That's one aspect. But the people of St. Lucia themselves were not prepared to be free because they were simply not prepared by their leaders. And if anybody well, what does that mean? Explain that to us. People did not understand independence. They were frightened, as you pointed out earlier, that Peter Josie was talking one thing about, you know, to, to have the right rectitude, to have young people walking straight. But it is, it is a kind of almost a joke because what about getting the discipline of a serious country? What, what about it? What about the word militarization that, that frightened people? That you're afraid of 42 years after independence. What about it? Perhaps Why Rick can you? help us in there. Rick, what about that frightened St. Lucians back then? And as he's saying, so frightened what, us what, now. What I, what I want to be careful about is if we are discussing the road to independence, I think we should, we should deal with that. And then having achieved independence, what we did, we have to be very careful, don't stray too far. Mm -hmm. I have nothing against discipline, and or discipline should be from, uh, from taught from school and at home. But that is about the smallest thing. If, in fact, you are pretending that you are independent. Already you're fooling yourself, you're fooling the people, and like I said, finally John Compton said that was a misnomer, that it was just, and in reality, and don't forget before the independence thing, there was, a, there was elections on, on, a, on the table, there was elections on the table, it was an election football. Okay, so all, all the matter of, 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 of the people weren't ready, whatever, I said, Britain had been warning us from the very beginning that the status we held was not going to be forever. And the main reason was Britain had its own money problems, its own economic problems, its own social problems, and could no longer, maybe because that bled us dry anyway, it could no longer be carrying us on our backs. That is the issue. So we, we, even now we are celebrating independence. To be independent, Lisa, You've got to be, be economically in, independent. Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing. You have to have people with a notion of what independence is all about. We have neither. And the, uh, the people have been kept at each other's throats as an instrument by which to get into office. Independence has nothing to do with those things, nothing at all. So we continue to celebrate independence when in fact we should be celebrating, I don't know if it's worth it, our disconnect from the colonial office in so far as we, as, as, as we dis disconnected. I can't help thinking that the whole thing w has been a, a, a joke perpetuated by politicians over the years to get into office or for whatever other reason. That's why I'm, I'm having a difficulty moving away from my point that independence, as we think it, never existed, never was on the cards, and that Compton ultimately admitted the people had been conned. But let's assume that they were serious, Rick. And one of the things Compton also said to, to his, um, in his favor, I would add, is that independence would allow us as a country to choose who our friends were. But even that um, is suspect because it seems to me that the only friends St. Lucia can choose in the eyes of her former bosses are people who think like the, the way the bosses think. And I'm referring specifically now to Cuba, which is an island in the Caribbean that has helped us far beyond her, capabi her own capabilities. Okay, training St. Lucians, giving St. Lucian scholarship. When this virus broke out, Cuban doctors and nurses came to help us. And yet it seems for some people, we ought not to say that. We ought not to mention Cuba. And one of the things I repeat that Sir John Compton, he died uh, knighted, said was that we would be free to choose our friends. But I think largely we've been very embracing of Cuba and all that it has done for us. But I want to ask a little clarification from you, Peter. Um, 
uh, from, from the excerpt there from uh, Foolish Virgins, John Adam issuing this public warning that come Independence Day, St. Lucia not, might not be the safest place in the world. What do you think uh, he meant by that? Let me make a confession to you that I believe only Rick in St. Lucia knows. I, I, I was going to suggest that is an <laughs> unfair question to Peter. No, let me, let me answer Rick. <laughs> I am going to suggest that only Rick can answer, yes. understand what I will say. And I will say it for St. Lucians to finally understand. <laughs> George Odenham and I were very close political allies. Some people even call us political twins. Mm -hmm. But I want to say to you, the viewers, and everybody who can hear me and see me, that 90% of the things George did, I knew nothing about. When he went to Radio um, <laughs> St. Lucia with Fadley and whoever, I was nowhere around. When the Boulevard thing was happening, I remember Rick was in George's office. I'm so happy he's there because <laughs> he was more than a, a fly on the wall. He was there yeah. at George's office with Fadley and one or two others. And when, no, uh, when, uh, just a little finish, Rick, when Compton applied for permission to have a public meeting on the Boulevard, <laughs> and, and Louise asked George whether he should do it. So George is consulting. I said, George, during the elections, Compton could not have a meeting on the Boulevard. And you are telling Louise that he should give him permission? I said, that will be chaos. They'll break down the place. We are the government now. Don't do it. Oh, George didn't take it. Rick is there. <laughs> Rick is my witness. I'm so happy you're here, Rick. These are things I had to take off my chest a long time ago. <laughs> So you had an inner understanding of what George meant by this. Rick knew everything. Um, <laughs> Peter, you know, Peter what, what Peter just said there, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the time we have, and really, this is the first time you're hearing reality about the, the 79, um, 82, 79, 82, which I, 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 I think of as our 9-11. When you say 9-11, you, you don't have to say anymore. 79, 82, you don't have to stay any, anymore for, to a certain age. Peter is absolutely correct that an, a lot of the things that George is quoted as saying, Peter was nowhere around. And a lot of the things that um, Peter and George are connected with, Peter was totally disconnected. But to answer your question, that, that was at, at, at just days before independence. And Martin Bell from the BBC and other um, reporters from all over the world really came to cover that. And it was of particular interest to them because by that time, there was that whole Luigi th faction, mm -hmm. there was that whole um, George Odlum th um, uh, faction, uh, if, I, if I'm correct on that, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it's going on. And Martin Bell actually, the, the, the Times in London didn't give the Labour Party a chance uh, of winning the election because, of course, Compton was the, the boy. and so, so All of this was wrapped up in politics. All of that was wrapped up in politics. So he's correct. Um, the statement uh, uh, George made to me was at a time when Martin Bell was around uh, filming everything. George Wohingson wrote a calypso about Martin Bell, the BBC. He's still around, I think. Uh, but So he wouldn't know anything about that. But George did say that. I should also co um, correct Peter on something there. The particular meeting um, he referred to, which I don't think was in the independence, um, that was just shortly before the, the, the bus stop in the boulevard, the night, the night before, the, the, the evening of the bus. Kenny Anthony, Winston Springer the Elder, myself, and a couple of others I don't remember now, were trying to, well, Kenny was trying to persuade George to cancel the, 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 meet, the permit for the meeting because there, there was obviously trouble. And George had stirred from that trouble by a phone call, a, a, a broadcast earlier in the day. Peter Josie gets a lot of blows for that. Peter Josie had nothing to do, I, I want to put in the record, I've said it before, had nothing to do with that. Peter walked in while the discussion was going on, the hopeless discussion was going on. He walked in with a guy called, from Dominica called Atherton, I forget his first name. They walked in, they were talking tete a tete, they moved around George's ministry, et cetera, and left. Willie James, later on, writing in something called a tumult, he wrote, and it's very funny written, because he, he started off by saying George was a gentilhomme, he was a good guy, he'd been to Oxford, he was a, a classy guy, he was a gentleman, all those, all those things. Therefore, it 
had to be Pizzo <laughs> Josie, who was behind the whole thing in the boulevard. Let me put it in the record. Nothing could be further from the truth. And it's a burden that Peter has carried. And yet he, he it doesn't deserve at all. That's a cross. Call it my cross. That's the cross I've carried so far. Yeah, so far. <laughs> so going back to your question about the statement, he would know nothing about that. But I was there and I report. And by the way, remember that when, the foolish, when those books came out, George was around to dispute and did not. Wow. Arthur and Marty was a progressive guy from Dominica. He was not in elections per se, but he was of the Morris Bishop, Peter Jones yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. thinking. Yeah. Let's go to another clip there of Sir John as he speaks on going to independence and the opposition he faced from his perspective. The first I went to the, we went to the party. We had a, a convention, party convention in Miku in 75 or 76. We had a party convention. We decided we are going into independence. We got a resolution passed in the party. We went to the parliament and presented the resolution in the parliament. Of course, it was opposed then. Uh, and we then approached the British government to start negotiation for independence. The, we had this problem. We had a British government representative who had been in Botswana, that's in southern Africa, near to South Africa. And he was as racist and apartheid as, as they come. To him, black people shouldn't govern themselves. They, they can't govern themselves. Look what's happening in South Africa. Look what happened in Nigeria. Look what happened in Ghana. All this confusion. Now, so he became the ally, or the Labour Party used him as their ally. And every time they made a meeting and keep noise and make a demonstration, he would send it up to the, to the British and say, you know, is there going to be bloodshed in St. Lucia? Is there going to be this in St. Lucia? And he delayed us to no end. We went, we went first. They said, fine, you go back and show that the people really want it. Issue a white paper and dis discuss it all over the country. We did that. We went back, tell us another story. Until 1978, we went to the Constitutional Conference. So John there looking at the opposition he faced going to independence. Rick, you had a chuckle. Well, I, I have a chuckle because the perpetuation of the myth is a lot of what's going on there. When he knew, no matter what he did, he was going to be cut off. I think Peter would agree with that. The plan mm -hmm. was to cut off these leeches. So all of that is almost irrelevant. And we've, as time went on, there's a guy called Paul Thoreau, a, a writer, and he says... The torch of time illuminates the darkest corners. The things that seem so dark and mysterious and, uh, you know, give it time and we'll see how clear it is. When you, chat, when, when you listen to, uh, to John Compton talking there, and over the years, the things that have evolved and the truths that have come out and the discussions that have been held, you, you know, what the heck is that Botswana and black people not controlling themselves, etc., etc. Britain was cutting us off, and the whole thing is based on a false premise. And my concern right now is for people to understand that we were cut off, that we, were, that we, we got political independence to do what the heck we wanted. What did that mean? I don't even know what that means. It means we could, we could, we could um, have term limits or not. It means we could ignore the Constitution or, 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 or as we please. Uh, that's what, this is what I particularly am very interested in discussing. I, the idea, I'm convinced that um, independence was a nice, um, for the moment, ploy, an election, um, football. The conservative people would want to go, would buy John Compton's story. The more radical 
and I say radical mainly in terms of following George and Peter Jose, not that they had any beliefs either. So you followed Peter, Peter and, 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 and George and so on, the younger people did that, you know. Um, but the more conservative kind of went for that. But both were conned. It's, it's not too late, if I may add, Rick and Lisa, it's not too late in my humble opinion for St. Lucians to ask themselves, what was on this white paper that the British <laughs> asked um, John Compton to prepare? Why did they ask him? The thing about Botswana and black people is a total throwaway <laughs> and completely irrelevant to what we are talking about. Um, perhaps we need to focus, as Rick said, on what the British wanted the government to prepare the white paper for. What was the reason? Why was it asked to do that? We've yeah. never had economic independence. In fact, we have always been broke. I've, I've always said that these countries really are close to failed states and have been for the longest while. We don't have the human resource um, relevant to our times. We have never had the money and we have never had natural resources like gold and all that kind of We've never had that. So what is it we wanted to do? What do we want? The freedom to borrow money without going to the colonial office? freedom not to account to the colonial office. This is what we should be discussing, and where do we go from here, having now a straighter, more realistic idea of what was perpetuated in the name of, um, of independence. So even though we are at this time celebrating and marking quote-unquote independence, that does not mean we can't face some inconvenient truths. Because if you're playing games with shadows, that's what you'll be, you'll, you'll be doing all the way, and no wonder we haven't moved. But Sir John is on record as saying that for him, the independence was really important to allow to give the, the power to the people, because the legislative council that uh, existed before gave none of that to the people. So for him, it was important for the people to be able to take ownership of where it is that they wanted to go. But I would, I would throw back a question at, at the questioner. I don't think anybody in St. Lucia believes the average person has any power. They think the power resides in the, the guys who are on the government side. Because we really, power is a funny, what, what, power to do what? It's like Compton said about the freedom, and I agree with him on that. Freedom has to mean more than um, the freedom to lie around or not go to work and the freedom to rob people and the freedom to beg and all that. It has to mean, mean a little more than that. Somebody said freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. That's, uh, that's worth thinking about as a Chris, Chris Christopherson song, you know. I am concerned that the people have been laboring, no pun intended, under a misconception since 1979. And if you're driving a car that does not exist, you're not going to move. If a car only exists in your mind, you're not going to move. The truth must be faced, and it doesn't mean that everything I say is the pristine truth, I say it and throw it out there for further discussion. Peter was a very much a part of this, so he can always say. Um, I notice you, you, you have not touched on what really went on in St. Lucia on the rocky road to independence, because there was a lot of trouble. St. Lucia suffered a lot of trouble on that myth mythological notion of independence. So don't preempt me, we're coming to right there to that point after this break. We'll take a short break and we'll be back. Hugging a rock, no, no. Advice, give you the please. Come 
for your mouth and your nose if you cough or sneeze. Practice social distancing and avoid large social gatherings. Together let us win this war. Be a soldier for seclusion. Together let us win this war. Seclusion be a soldier. Together we can beat this corona. For further information, please contact the hotline at 311 or the Bureau of Health Education at 468-5349. And welcome back to our special discussion in studio here. In observance of St. Lucia's 42nd anniversary of independence in studio with me is Rick Wayne, no stranger to the St. Lucian population, as well as Peter Josie. And so we're discussing, were you there? A look at the fight of St. Lucia's independence. Uh, we want to go to another clip uh, of Sir John. We set that up, and then we'll come back, we continue the conversation. To the Constitutional Conference in London, and... We agreed that we should that we'd have our independence. We even set the date to the 13th of December. That was the date for independence. But the Labour Party at the time, they wanted elections before independence. And that has never happened. Jamaica got it without elections. Trinidad got it. Guyana got it. Grenada got it. Nobody ever, that was never imposed as a condition on any one of them. But it was sought to impose it as a condition to us. And the Labour Party objected, they demonstrated, they did all of these things. Now, what had happened in, uh, in, in the Caribbean? There was a lot of turmoil. There was Grenada, there was Cuba, there was all of this thing. And they exploited that. They, they created a lot of confusion. There was coming to independence, uh, besides the, the demonstrations and whatever it is, coming to independence, they, are, they fermented strikes in the public services. Teachers strike civil service strike, this strike, that strike, and trying to, to postpone it, try to impede it. But of course, the, the, the thing had passed to the British Parliament, there's nothing they could do to stop it. What they did was to, to impede the celebrations of it. So John there, really setting that stage there, and Ricky, we were talking about a lot of the turmoil that was happening on the ground. And so we, we get into that. But before we get that, what happened, Peter, to the December 13, 1979 date? You remember earlier, you mentioned that Alan Luizzi, who was the leader of the opposition, had asked for a postponement of the date of elections. For independence. For independence, sorry. This was never about John Compton or the UWP. Independence was for the people of St. Lucia. And who made the decision that it should be on the 13th of December? So the date, February 22nd, 1979, did you and your members have a role to play in that? Were you, did you agree upon this date since December 1378? No, it was, a was it was a compromise date. What we wanted was to have elections. Okay. And as a compromise, they gave that date, but the real compromise, the British thought they did at the time, and um, we, we bought it, and I say we as the Labour Party, was that there would be elections within six months of independence. Why was that so important, Peter? It is important because we want to know, you can only test how people really feel. You can only test how people really feel. And uh, in those elections in '79. The Labour Party won a two-thirds majority. Uh, you can then argue whatever happened to that afterwards maybe is relevant. But the point about it is that the people, and we talk about the people, the people, the people, they gave the Labour Party a two-thirds majority. So the constitution could have been amended. As usual, people were too busy about their own personal agendas at the time. And I say more, no more on this because <laughs> uh, people were not around to answer. 
So <laughs> I, I don't. Gentle leave it there. So, I, we'll, I, I so have, we'll go to break. I, I have, I have um, Rick, Rick, I because Rick you spoke about the turmoil that, that came on the road to independence and all there was. And we saw in the clipping there, in the newspaper clippings, the, the strikes with the civil servants, the teachers. Um, but certainly, it's ironic, I think, to, to my own mind, because Sir John, in his foyer into, into the politics here, had led a six-week strike of, of the sugar cane um, and farmers. And so to, for him to have had to deal with that in government, um, I thought was, was really a, an irony there. Um, speak to us about that era, the, having the teachers were out really for more than a month on, on, on strike uh, if, and the civil service as well. If you listen to what Sir John, well, John comes on the time, not Sir, so we can, when I say Sir, uh, if you listen to what Sir John is saying there, is not saying. If you listen to what he's not saying, because he's saying it even though he's not saying it, you detect an election campaign. Is in the, he, he's in the middle of an election campaign. If you look at the headlines that accompanied the clip you just showed there, those were election mood headlines. So Comden did not want an election because he wasn't comfortable with the mood of the day. The mood of the day had been changed radically by Peter Josie and George Arlong primarily. Whatever way you want to look at it, people did feel empowered, perhaps in the worst way. Perhaps the people didn't quite understand what it is to have power. It was, it was mainly a, a rebellion. It was almost a rebellion in what had been there before. Because, yes, there was a very class-conscious St. Lucia at the, at the time, very class-conscious. There was a certain group of people who were elite. And a uh, matter of fact, I have some wars with their offspring right now. Because I, I tell them, I, I remind them at that time, and I tell them that they, they come across now as if they, 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 they came from Touwoosh. <laughs> you know, because all of a sudden they... So... I've had my wars with them for a long time. So what there was, was I would prefer to use um, what Peter and George primarily had stirred up was a rebellion against the status quo. And that mm -hmm. rebellion of against the status quo also included a rebellion of whatever Alan Luisi stood for. Mm -hmm. Because Alan Luisi was made more of the stuff of John Compton. In fact, we don't have enough time because Alan Luisi's main advisor for quite a while while in government was John Compton. I know I was his personal assistant at the time. So, so that kind of stuff was going on. So Peter, Josie, and George primarily had created um, a, a, an atmosphere of rebellion. In, I don't want to say empowered because there's no power involved in that. And that is what Compton is referring to about the this and that. Now, if you want to go into the details, I not necessarily, but there was a lot of chaos in the country. I once said to both Peter and George, on a show that I figured they owe St. Lucian's um, books about that period, a number of things that they did were involved in that on reflection looks mad, but may well have been the only way to bring about the change. And that, that those very things have no place right now in, in, in the country because we, are, we, we, we can't be more in control of things happening here. And what we're in danger of doing is destroying ourselves to show that we can. Mm. You know, we, are in the, we, have, we have so misunderstood power that we, we are turning our own guns on ourselves right now. At the time, Peter, jo Peter Josie, and I had my... my, my my, my, my moods and my times and my feelings, dis disagreements with them or with them at, an, at another time, depending on, I'm still the same, I guess. You know, think of it as a rebellion against the status quo and that the status quo was basically elitist. So it wasn't that difficult for those guys and Peter Josie and George Adler in their heyday were firebrands, mm -hmm. you know. The, the reason Peter and, and, and George got so close together, that's, a, that's for Peter to talk about, and how close, in fact, they were. I refer to them in my book, Dirt in the Morning, as the Odlum and Josie Josie. monster. Mm -hmm. Because y y what you saw was a melding of these two guys. 
and Peter seeming the more radical. Is that true, Peter? Let's get Peter. Peter, did you think? Do you believe that you were? I said seeming, huh? That seemingly the more radical of the two of you. People said what they want about me. I've never questioned them, so I leave that to them. All I'm prepared to do is to give the facts, and I spoke only from my heart. I never spoke the politics as politicians do. And I just want to, to, to say one more, th to add something to what Rick said. I said recently on a radio station, maybe about a month ago or less, that when I got on the forum platform in 1970 um, or thereabouts, the darkest person at Barclays Bank was Hollis Bristol. <laughs> that was the remnants. You see, Hollis is almost right. Eh? That was the remnants of the colonial system. And one of the things George and I did with the help of people like Mikey Pilgrim and others was when we got into office to begin to start to establish the Bank of St. Lucia, which was the, the, the national, started as a national commercial bank. I want to make that point because we used to talk about commanding the highest point of our economic resources, which is our money. I know there was the, the, the Cooperative Bank, which is now the first national bank, but we were determined to establish our own bank. And today, it is the biggest bank, the biggest local bank in the East, um, OECS. Okay? So I want to say that, to emphasize it, because writing it in a book is not sufficient. I've written that. I want to say it. This is the kind of contribution, and the people like the, 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 the name I just mentioned, and people of that complexion, I used to just group all of them as the remnants, the word remnants, of the colonial system, because there was a hierarchy based on pigmentation. The color of your skin meant so much in those days, and I know it kept a lot of black and dark-skinned people back. If you were fair, and as you, my parents, and my, not my parents so much, my grandparents used to say, and it's a phrase I've used recently, and some people try to ridicule and papi show it and talking nonsense. St. Lucians love a cooler YII up to now because they know that if you had that little cooler YII like the Rick Waynes and people like that, <laughs> you, you, could, you could get away, you could get a little pass. You understand what I'm saying? But these but, are the complexities but here is, but of, here is of, the, of our here, colonial here, here times. Here again, Peter has just raised the point I made. The, what I, I, if I dare say, the very important point I made. At having gotten the power, at least on the paper, they then turned on themselves and destroyed themselves. That's why you had the, uh, the Louisy thing, the power mm -hmm. struggle. And again, Peter got a lot of blows on that too, unfairly. I want to add that. Again, Th thank you, Rick. I, I don't I, know if you have time, but Rick. Peter, Peter has <laughs> taken a lot of blows for, for that. a lot of things. It's for I'm, that one in particular. I'm glad you are clearing your conscience. But it, on, no, I've always <laughs> said that. But it underscores what I'm saying that you, you, when you have a rebellion that you pretend is an empowerment, the revolution and turns you, on and itself, you don't, and you don't educate that 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 crowd i mean it happened in, in, in um grenada too by the way i don't want to go into that yeah. no but we come we're coming to grenada but just to uh just to expand on what uh, peter was saying here on the establishment of the national commercial bank and the Saint Lucia development bank and also abolishing user fees and health facilities that happened under sir alan louise just a little fact uh, there um as a little, when they came into and government in July 2nd, 1979. That's the point I'm trying to make. It would not have happened without myself and George Odlum supporting Alan Luisi. So the question, supporting so Alan the question then is, what happened after that? Yeah, so what happened after that? So we, we, the we power, get in... The power went to some of... <laughs> yeah? so the power went into the, the heads of some of my <laughs> friends. But I must say categorically, you know, and Alan Luizzi was forced to resign. Yeah, I, I never had, I never was ambitious enough to be prime minister because I was afraid of it. If I was prime minister, I it would enter my head to do things that the people were not ready for. So I thank God every day, and I've never been a person after power like the average politician. My power is to see people grow and develop, you know, from. Poor poverty, being ambitious, working hard, 
trying to save, send your children to school because your generation, if you never went to school, might not be the one to come back and build a house for you. The one that is at school now, at university, this is the one you have to look forward to, continue to support them. That has always been my kind of mantra and approach to how we evolve and develop as a people. Revolution was in the wind. The presumed happy-go-lucky tourist brochure people of the Caribbean have begun to grumble and rebel against Whitehall-oriented governments, such as Premier John Compton's. While the new breed of politician was concerned, Fidel Castro was God. Cuba, heaven, and socialism, the road to salvation. Compton fought back. He offered St. Lucians the desperate promise that the solution to their problems was synonymous with independence from Britain. Though that was the thought for Sir John, we had the Grenada-Cuba effect, eminent revolution in the region from Grenada, and the effects of that in our local politics. Take us to that time period. What was that like? Because again, we're going through your book, gave the sense that there were Senusians who were very wary about what was taking place in Grenada and the sorts of uh, love affair that John Odlum seemed to have had with Grenada and... Uh, John or George? George. George Odlum had with Grenada. <laughs> you know, I laugh at it because, again, another farce. Another... another um, Fakery. Another, another, another joke that, that people have paid. At the end of the day, just to encapsulate quickly, there was the Grenada, quote unquote, revolution. You know the only people who really talk about the Grenada revolution? They are the people who were close to it, who were part of it, etc. Mm -hmm. Almost every other writer either makes, uh, if Naipaul is one, of course, but Naipaul carries a burden. They will say he was um, racist and everything else. But almost every writer except somebody like Sir, one or two others. But the idea that a re there was a revolution, what it, what it was like to most people was a copycat situation. Morris Bishop was genuine. Morris Bishop came to St. Lucia, and I don't think that anybody who met him was not impressed with it. Peter was, was there, I have pictures of the guys together. Morris Bishop had a, a ambition, but like St. Lucia, the revolution turned on itself in Grenada. And they destroyed themselves, and their lives were lost, and Grenada is back to whatever Grenada has always been. When we, when we rebel in St. Lucia and break down everything, etc., two days later, St. Lucia is still St. Lucia, none the richer, people are not better off, we don't have any, uh, anything to pull from this one and give that one. There's not even a redistribution of wealth situation in the country, possibility in the country. Some countries that rebel and, ha that and have coups and all that kind of stuff, they are rich countries and they, the, the effort is to redistribute, redistribute wealth and, and make things more even. So Lucia doesn't have wealth for redistribution. So you, you wonder why we want a revolution it, rather than to use the system we have, use it properly, and make sure everybody is entitled to order. Because we have the means. That's what we went independent for. We have the means. Look at when we tried to modify the, 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 the Constitution. It was thrown out. One of the main things, the main recommendations was that the Prime Minister was seen generally um, as having too much power and they wanted buffers between the Prime Minister's power and so on and so on. The Labour Party side went totally, in fact the main reason Kenny Anthony gave for, th for dumping or putting it aside was that the, the recommendations were too obsessed with the power of the Prime Minister. Yeah? But finally, both in Grenada and St. Lucia, if you want to call what happened in, in 79 and so on as something of a revolution. It wasn't. It was just unrest. St. Lucia paid. Only St. Lucia paid. Business paid. Tourism paid. In Grenada, only Grenadians paid and then returned to the huts. 
and then return to the hatch. It's like a, a home, a husband and wife fighting the hell. You cripple her husband, and, but you decide you're not, you're not going anywhere, and so you're not, you now have a, a crippled husband in your house. This is what these unrest and revolutions total to in, in our region, Lisa. And then we give, we give people um, glazed over, whitewashed, versions of what happened there. Like I was talking to somebody, uh, Sir John talking there. If you listen, and if you know what he's talking um, about, enough about St. Lucia on your own, you know he was talking about elections. And you know he was worried that the Labour Party would win the elections. And he was hoping that independence would give him the, 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 the safe road away from elections. Of course, those guys, Peter and those guys had things too cornered, um, 79. Um, interestingly, George Adam didn't win that election, did he? <laughs> no. Interestingly, George Adam, the main man, mm -hmm. he did not win. He couldn't beat Maroc. In 74. 74. In 74. Well, that's 74, yeah. Well, you would have thought he would have. You would have thought he would have even then. He didn't. Mm -hmm. And but then by our account, he was saying that perhaps what, what he had done, he had not understood the election machinery as he should have. C Compton was very worried about the election result. And, and um, ironically... When the Labour Party then came in, having won the election, it was the Labour Party that went to sign on the documents and make the speeches. George, <laughs> I happened to be there um, recording it, taking notes and, and interviewing and seeing for myself everything. That's why I'm in a position to write my views on what transpired. And very, very little of it has been disputed. But, it, but on reflection, because I too was caught up in the thing, I thought it was a wonderful thing, but we're now at the UN. It has meant nothing. It, in the, in, 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 at, the, at the bottom of it all, all these things were nothing more than flashes. Flashes, you know. It's pathetic when you think about it. But, but it's also, Rick, it's also, Rick, that at the time, all of these islands believed, and I believe justifiably so, that the colonial office or if you prefer, the British government had their favorite politicians. And that is one of the reasons the, the, the opposition in those days became even more determined, became more radical, mm -hmm. and what have you. That, that was part of it. And by the way, I saw with my eyes, I almost say my own two eyes as we say, when George got defeated in 1974, that was no accident, you know. Judge was played badly. I was at the back of the morn at the polling station just past the little Catholic church up there. Right around there, there was a polling station. And there was a relay ballot. There was a relay ballot going on. And the people that were supporting George or the thing for George were absent. They were nowhere around. So people were coming. They were giving a ballot that was already marked, going in, dropping it. As John Compton himself would say, one kind of cocoa mockery took place there. That it would be impossible for George to have won, in my humble opinion. Could not have won. They played him. And, and they did Frances the same thing in Denry North. Frances, Frances Michel. Michel. I can tell you what he told me on that. He said um, he, he had, uh, I think it was 74. Yeah, he said he, w he lost, not because of Maroc. And Maroc was the seasoned politician, let's say that, Peter. Yeah. She was your house to house, everybody. Yeah. She was in every Holy Mary and everything. The so Miss Haraldine Rock. Maroc, yeah. Haraldine Rock. And George told me personally, I wrote it, that um, he, he, he wasted his time um, campaigning for deadbeats. And the deadbeats he referred to in particular was Hunter Francois, because Hunter Francois refused to do house to house, so George was doing house to house, or George said, on behalf of him. But George did no house to house on his own behalf, Peter. Mm. He didn't but, believe in that. But George is not really a house to house man. George is a public platform man, and George, exactly. George admired and adored Francois almost like a god, you know. Yeah. He loved Hunter Francois. <laughs> Because Hunter Francois, don't forget, 
um, same boat. Was, was a literary man like George. Yeah. They loved the English yeah. language more yeah. than they loved their own children. Yeah. Right. You know? So the mind what, what the was mind. important. Yeah. So he was in love with his mind. Yeah. And we want, before we go to break, we want to take another clip in from Sir John. And he's talking about Independence Day itself, when that day arrived. We didn't want to celebrate our independence on the threat of riots, a threat of that. The, for instance, the flag raising ceremony was to be the only place we had at the time was the Marshall Grounds, the Mindefiller Park, only place with the op big open space and such. We had to keep it on the, on, on the wharf. Why did we keep it on the wharf? Because of security reasons. The British will not allow Princess Alexandra, who was the royal representative, to drive through the Marshall Road, lest she be ambushed, etc., etc. It's that type of fear. Not us, because we know that was nonsense. We would never do this. That's not St. Lucia. But that British government representative had instilled, had pushed in the minds of the British. There were going to be riots, etc., etc. So we had it low-keyed. Many people didn't, didn't have it as we would like to have had it. Instead of had the, the big celebration for independence was ready, the carnival that followed it because it was a few days after Carnival was a few days after Independence without a hell of a time. But for Joe's times, it's really frightening because of the, the threats that existed at the time, that there were going to be disruption, there was going to be this, going to be that. The, the customs and strike, we couldn't get people in. We had to get, had to send send some people down there to take over from, from the, the customs that their people get their baggage through. A lot of difficulties, it humiliated us. St. Lucians, it humiliated us. But I told them at the time with all of this, they, they came to give us very bad press. I used the occasion of the youth rally in 79 to set out our goals. I told them, told the children at the time, that we have to prove that not that we'll do no worse than those who ruled us before. Not that we'll do as good as they did, but we have to do better. And that is what I set out to do, to do better, to give solutions and opportunity that they did not have under the past regimes. So you heard Sir John there, the, the Independence Day arrives, and he speaks about having to hold that official ceremony there on the wharf because of uh, the threat of violence. Rick, your reaction to that? Well, you see, again, I was... I was while it was going on, I was thinking, what is he talking about? And then, of course, it occurred to me that a lot of what was going on in St. Lucia was being covered by the British press just before the independence, including that statement by George that um, he Saint can't Lucia. guarantee the safety. St. Lucia know, would not be the safest like place in the world. All of that stuff also appeared elsewhere. So that is why the British government would, would, have, would have wanted security. Actually, Princess Alexandra, I wrote I write about that um, arrival here. There were no crowds. There were no. It was no um, trouble. It was quite. It was almost a non-event. Her getting here. So again, all of that was the mirage. But I can understand he played on it because George was especially George on independence. Peter not so much in the independence story talking. It is George who had the whole BBC. George was like a movie star uh, for all these uh, foreign, foreign press. George, well, as we journalists, we don't go to listen to the quiet guys. We go to the guys who make the sensational statements. And George and his background, theatrical background, it was street theater. And George couldn't wait to, to, for, and Martin Bell and his crew to, to, to record um, stuff and to, to, to publish it next day in a British paper. So he's right. There was uh, this th affair or whatever. But there was some real, maybe Peter can talk that uh, part, but there were some real occurrences 
on, on that on that, the ground yeah. before then. We will get to Peter right after this break. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do. The that no, think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. Use organic and join. Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rice St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution. Uh, Peter, before we went to break, you were going to comment a bit there on what Sir John had to say regarding Independence Day and that official ceremony and the threat, the perceived threat of violence. There are two points that may not appear to be connected, and I hope your viewers, the audience, and yourself could connect them. The first is, when you go to Oxford University to study politics, philosophy, and economics, in the British culture and the British politics, you have come to be trained so that the British can send you back out to be a leader that Britain can deal with. As George Odlam was so trained. Oh, yeah, I mean. Any one of those who went up there, Eric Williams, Anna Robinson, um, Guy in Barbados was his name, Grantley Adams, mm -hmm. not Grantley, Grantley's son, right? Mm -hmm. All of these guys and more. So you expect the British press to pay a lot of attention to George. And George understood that. George loves the theater. He loves literature. He likes to. George taught me in Form 2, you know, at St. Mary's College. A lot of people don't believe that. There's a fairly big gap in age between us. And when George was lecturing, if he had slept the night before, a lot of times he came sleeping in the English literature class. But if he was feeling good, he would be prancing and walking and motioning in front of the crowd. No other master did that like him. I, I was a young fellow then. I was in Form 2, and I've never forgotten that. Remember him. The other point that is not connected, but you can feel free to connect it if you want, and Rick is correct. By the time the princess and the representatives of Her Majesty's government arrived in St. Lucia, the people of St. Lucia had literally sort of given up the Labour Party had said, okay, well, you win this round. We'll wait till elections. To put it very um, succinctly, and I, I hope bluntly too, you have succeeded in getting it. We'll forget about that. And I don't think anybody would have hurt or harmed the Queen's representative in St. Lucia. And, and I used to represent Marsha at that time. We never had a public meeting in Marsha, as far as I can recall, saying any... Um, negative thing about the Queen and the English Parliament and that and that. All our discussions were either on the Castries Market steps or elsewhere around the island. So if John Compton wants to say that the Queen would be unsafe because of all the nonsense that was going up to England, he probably had information that we at the time did not have. Okay? But so do you think on the ground, Peter, that perhaps the, the ground swell was so much coming from the work that St. Lucia Forum and the St. Lucia Labour Party um, were, were doing that perhaps it could have been perceived that there would have been threat. Yeah, but don't forget the people are not as stupid as some people would make them out to be. Because there were pockets of violence. Yeah, people can make up their own minds. And, and interestingly, one of the things that happened, and, and I certainly had no knowledge of it, I'm not sure if George had, was when the prisoners in Castries, they were all overcrowded in the Castries at the top of Bridge Street there. And they often absconded. And, and they, they set the prison on fire. That was one of the big things that happened around the time of independence. But as far as the safety of Her Royal Highness is concerned, I cannot say that that was an issue that I saw. That was but, but safety is, is always better. All right. 
we want to speak about the 79 election specifically. So we will hear, we'll, hold on Rick, we'll hear from Sir John on the 79 elections from his perspective and we'll talk a bit about what was really going on on the ground at the time. And then I know that point you want to come to, we'll come to that as well. So let's hear from Sir John. I never accepted with those. The elections were hijacked. There was a hijacking. You know, all the threats. If you look and see the number of people who voted, it was one of the lowest. I think it was just over 55 or 60 percent voted. Thousands of people abstained because they were afraid. They were afraid. We lost the elections. We still, as the UWP, we still got 42 percent of the votes. We still had a substantial support. Now, you had this infighting within the Labour Party, which caused us a lot of grief. You had the, 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 the confusion between uh, Louise and the Louise faction and the Ordnum faction. It is similar to what I had with George Charles and in, in, the, in the 60s. You had a new set of people coming in and con in getting in conflict with the older regime. And you had this leadership struggle. But what gave what gave this thing greater, greater impetus is what had happened was happening outside. You had the, in Cuba, you had Castro, okay? You had, in Jamaica, you had Manly. In Guyana, you had Burnham. And in Grenada, you had Bishop. So all of these factors concentrated on, on the confusion in institution. So John, they're speaking about the 79 elections, which were held uh, the 2nd of July, 1979. The Senusha Labour Party won 12 of the 17 seats, and the voter turnout was 68.0% uh, then. So official statistics there on the 79 elections. So John says he didn't lose, the UW didn't lose, the elections was hijacked. Your thoughts? We'll go to you, Rick, and I know you also had a point that you wanted to make. Well, he's consistent because he has always said that. But in interviews like this, which, which, which is, he's not, nobody's proving for any, any, any uh, um, answers, this is just an opportunity to vent, really, that kind of interview. Nobody's questioning him back, but what about this or what, what, none of that. He has always maintained from the election itself, and I guess he died, still thinking of that word, a hijack. But what is a hijack? What is a hijack? I mean, there's an election. He is the, the government. Governments have perhaps even more influence on, 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 on things than the opposition, especially a radicalized opposition as it was at the time. So I have no idea what he meant by he, he was hijacked. He also insisted that people were afraid to come out to vote. That is possible because Josie and, and George had created, a, and with their support and whatnot, the kind of support they had, the people who were coming out at the time. Mm -hmm. I can well understand that there may have been um, what we called earlier on the elitist set who did not, um, who, who didn't come out to vote. You only have to read um, Joyce O'Geish's autobiography, sort of, and you will, you'll get a feeling of that because Joyce O'Geish was part of that. So inadvertently, she tells you how she felt and how a lot like her must have felt as well. So I'm not going to argue with him mm -hmm. that quite likely a lot of people you know, just didn't vote. Well, that's, that seems to me uh, the, the fault of the UWP for not instilling in their people a feeling of safety that the elections would be properly um, secured, protected, so that 
all, all, the, all, all the propaganda would be nothing more than propaganda. So if, I don't know, but if he, let, if he dropped the ball and the Labour Party won, as a result, because you don't call it a hijack, you screwed up. So but it was a very well-oiled machinery for the Senusha Labour Party joining hands of the Senusha Forum, um, Peter. And from all that I seem to have been reading and gathering, because it was not of this time, um, George had such an integral part to play as, as almost a sort of campaign manager. I got the impression that he was the one who was really selecting the candidates and being able to do all of the strategic planning for the Senusha Labour Party, having brought in the Senusha Forum on board as well. So do you believe, Peter, that the UWP and uh, Sir John had not lost that election, which was hijacked? I'm really sorry that um, <laughs> this is what is being used now. The UWP lost the election fair and square, and they knew that. Sir John Compton was a master politician. And I'll tell you something. There is no other politician that I know in St. Lucia or elsewhere who could destroy an opponent mm -hmm. more thoroughly and completely than Sir John. When he was ready to destroy George Charles, and they were in the same Labour Party, he said the British government came to St. Lucia to speak to George Charles, who was chief minister at the time. And George Charles used to like a good drink, OK, like so many other of us. Compton said, so they, they tried to wake him up in the morning. And they called George Charles. And George Charles slept. They tried to wake him, and he slept. You understand? Know, Sleeping, the implication was that he was so drunk, he couldn't wake up. And I'll tell you, he repeated that a few times. That is, Compton repeated that a few times. And that was the end of George Charles. In fact, <laughs> I believe George Charles will be drink, drunk more after that. But what happened is that Compton had finally met his match. George Odlum could speak better than Compton, both in English, although George didn't start as a Creole-speaking person. He learned on his way, and he always said that if he didn't have people like me around, he probably would not have learned. But Compton finally met his match in George Odlum, although to some extent, George did not destroy people as much as promote a new ideology, and did it very famously, as he himself used to say, by dropping the pebble in the pool. So he knew when to thunder like a hundred volcanoes, or, or not volcanoes, but rather um, waterfalls, and when to drop the pebble in the pool. And I developed that at one time too. And so when George and myself were speaking on the market steps, and there were thousands of people there, there was a time, Lisa, I actually got frightened. I stopped to drop the pebble in the pool, as they say. And I could literally hear a pin drop. I said, Jesus Christ, these people are listening with so rapt attention. How could you ever satisfy these people in government? What am I going to do? I've never been frightened before in my life or since. But it just goes to show how people were listening. So Compton no longer had the heirs of the people of St. Lucia as he had in George Charles' time or, or even you know, soon after George Charles for Kenneth Foster, because Kenneth became the leader of the Labour Party, Kenneth Foster, mm -hmm. after George Charles. So Compton just used to, to, to just run riot with these guys. But when he had George and myself, that was a double barrel attack. But why could it not work? That's the question I think I want to come to, Rick. And I see you. I, I want to comment pointing. a little bit on what Peter just said there. Okay. Understand that Peter is talking from the perspective of being on the platform. Right. Mm -hmm. I, on the other hand, I'm the journalist. I'm the one questioning a particular kind of journalist. I'm the one talking to George off. I'm the one talking to Peter. I'm the one talking to people. I'm the one following them around. What these guys did, I said it earlier, was to empower, I use the word empower, um, with caution, um, people who felt they were nothing. They, they, they gave those people a feeling of worth. 
George mm -hmm. and all his literary allusions on platform, George was barely understood by 90% of the people <laughs> who came to see him. George was performing. And I gave a number of instances where George misquoted Shakespeare, mm -hmm. including, um, I was a victim of that. I actually quoted him on something by Thomas Gray to find out later on it was an absurdity. I corrected it later in, in, in my But he also had a sort of uh, uh, angst that he did not have the grassroots following that he wanted. Is, is that not Oh, so? no, no, no. George had the grassroots. Had the grassroots. Oh, George had the, the guy. The, what co they created. Developed well, it along the way. Peter, Josie, and George gave new meaning to the grassroots. It wasn't theirs, some came from the States. But they gave St. Lucia meaning to St. Lucia grassroots. And which was to say the ordinary, quote unquote, the ordinary person, the person who felt left out, mm -hmm. the non Bristols and the non Girodi type of people. Okay? Those people felt they had no status. And they were far more, as now, far more of those people. St. Lucia has always had far more people who feel they have no status. Peter, Josie, and George gave them worth to come out. They were almost proud to be silly or proud to talk about their patois and everything else. So there was a kind of rebellion against this, not a kind, there was a rebellion against the status quo. Whether Peter could have said whatever he said on that platform. Some of it was grotesque, but don't nobody. The, the, the feeling for Peter now, you know, even as we speak, I am sensing a kind of revenge by certain people. What is interesting to, uh, also is that a lot of, uh, a, a number of people who are Peter's detractors are hardcore labor from that time. Some of them may well have had roots, you know, UWP roots as well. Like when he said earlier on, I think he did, that at a particular convention, um, when he lost, he, he, he lost Cauldron, challenged Juliet Hunt, um, and they lost, and they were outside. That's quite true. Outside, uh, near the bar, when we were talking and everything. And he interrupted that, Peter. He did. He said, guys, I better go on and congratulate Julian Hunt. <laughs> that was the end of the, That was the end of it when he went to do that. He, was, he wasn't well, well received. But you, you, you have to think of the time, the atmosphere. It was right, and the right people were there to do it. George was there. Um, effectively to, 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 to be Shakespeare, uh, so to those with um, illusions of, of, of um, delusions of grandeur, mm -hmm. that they were like George, like the students, the university students, all these guys were in George's camp. And then you had the, um, the, the, the radical, ordinary Rasta man, and all those, all those, I mean, don't forget these guys promised to free up the weed. All, all that kind of stuff was going on. And there was the rebellion against the status quo that Compton represented. You know, it, 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 so it was perfect for them. What happened afterward? And that's what I want to come to. What happened, uh, Peter? Because and just by to all... Add, just to add a little bit of salt to what Rick just said about George. When George was going on with his highfalutin English, <laughs> a guy from Castro... And you know, Castro has always had little... Sof city sophisticates who, who understood English, could speak English a little better than their country um, brothers, mm -hmm. right? They would pass, and George would be going on, man, and they would shout, words, boy, words, Gasso, words. Let me do a better impression <laughs> of that, Peter. He's <laughs> correct. <laughs> they would stand out there, obviously not understood a word George said, and quite often George has screwed up anywhere because he's not George had no need to prepare. That's, <laughs> that's arrogance, okay? If not contempt. Monsieur, words, monsieur, words, monsieur, words. <laughs> they have no idea what, what he's saying there. He's correct, but that is an but indicator. But they know English words, though. It, that is an indicator of George's ability at the time to walk on water. He could do no wrong, and, and yet could not get elected. And could not get elected. So that with all of, the, with the win and everything of Peter, the leadership struggle within the Labour Party, why did that come about? How did that come about? You know, this is one of the saddest <laughs> things that happened in my political <laughs> lifetime because when it was um, mooted that Alan Louisi should be the leader of the party because Kenneth Foster would not 
take us to victory. The first thing we did was to try to see if we can organize a convention. Mm -hmm. But George did not have the confidence that the people would elect him as political leader. I had no interest whatsoever. Interesting point. And I, and I don't think anybody else had any interest. Why, so why did you not have any interest? Because I, I think that you know, um, there were people like George and others who were older than me and maybe deserved a break before me. I thought I had time on my side. That, that was the main thing. It was that I was not ambitious. But um, I didn't think it was my turn as yet. Let's put it that way. And the name Alan Louise came up, and there were things said for him. And, but I, I said to myself, I didn't know the guy personally, but when I heard and read a little about him, I said, guys, George, I spoke to George in particular. I said, George, why? This guy is not going to be able to do what is demanded of us now. Alan is going to be too conservative too colonial, even more than Compton. But George at the time, his reply was, but you see, Peter, he might be able to lead us to victory. I said, but even though he leads, he'll be prime minister, and that's the key point. But George was not seeing that. In other words, we could have gotten somebody, I believe, maybe younger and things, so, but George wanted Louise, because he thought Louise had the image, Gigi, a uh, 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 judge of the high court. Right? Supreme um, Court. I was never in favor of that. So after the leadership thing, it, it got to, I understood that George wanted to win with Alan Luizzi. But as soon as Luizzi wins, to knock him out of the prime minister's position and for him, George, to emerge as prime minister. Now, George had never discussed that particular point with me. I, sure. I got to understand it afterwards. May, so I put, may I put the attack on Peter? Because you, you notice he's saying, I, uh, I got to understand. That's an interesting statement. I got to understand. Only after it, the elections. What, what it tells you, in other words, Peter Josie had no idea that Luigi and George had an arrangement. And even as he's speaking here, and how much George wanted that Luigi, maybe he can make us win and so on and so on, despite everything that was going on, they had to separate on all the... I am wondering now if that arrangement, Peter, and, and George's insistence on le letting Luigi agree he make a good prime minister, if in George's mind he was thinking, well, I have an arrangement with him, let him win the elections, and I'll be prime minister six months later. Because but that, 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 was, came that was out, the arrangement. That came out after the, after the very first meeting where all of the candidates, the winning candidates won. The only person who did not contest elections and did not win, and who was there was, is the present governor general. And what I understood, I was fully supportive of George up to that point, eh? because don't forget, we had disagreed on the Lizzie thing, but I thought it was too small, and if Alan Luizzi wins as prime minister, fine. But Luizzi at that first meeting said, when George actually brought up the point. Now, <laughs> and that is o the only time I knew, and that was after the election, that there might have been some arrangement. And Luizzi said, give me a year. May I come in again, please? Uh, before the elections, because I had put together the manifesto, I was with, with, with the guy, so I put together, different, by, I mean setting it up, not, I didn't write it, uh, I put it together for, for them. And I went, I was very much involved in the movement, <laughs> and I went to, to, to Alan Luizzi, uh, asking him if, I wanted, if, if he was okay to put his photograph on the front of the um, manifesto and so on. I, I couldn't just do that because there was that thing with Luigi and George anyway. And Luigi took me upstairs to his, his shop, you know, and he wanted to discuss instead this. He says, Rick, we're going to win that election hands down, but we we're not going to keep the government. And it was after that, he, he never told me about the, the arrangement. He says, we're going to win the election hands down, mm -hmm. but we're not going to keep the government. I found out later, when George, went there. and that's where Peter comes in there, because I think it was Peter who wrote to Luigi, you, know, you, you can take over Peter, mm -hmm. telling him you made a bargain, keep it. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't write. I spoke at the meeting. I said, you know, if you made a bargain, you should Peter keep it. But, well. but, but, there's nothing wrong in my humble opinion, again, I keep using the word humble opinion, that we, 
could not wait for Alan Weezy for a year. After a year, things settled down. People are beginning to get accustomed to the Labour Party. The Governor General and the, 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 the British government and the royal family does not like the idea or do not like the idea of the representative of the British Crown, which is the Governor General, being shifted around as soon as an election is finished that like a that football. So Alan Lewis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that was made known to us in no uncertain terms. In other words, wait a decent time, guys. You all just won. Take it easy. Don't don't just kick off our, um, Ali Lewis of, of, of the thing. But had not, but didn't Alan Lewis resign before that, Peter? And took it back or something? No. No, not yeah. that I know of. Yeah. Yes, so, he did. So Alan, so Alan Lewis now said, and say, fine, we agree. I think you're right, Rick. But, but by then, I believe George might have written quietly to him and put so much pressure on the Governor General oh. that he was prepared to go, but he wanted to go as part of an embarrassment to us. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's the mm -hmm. British monarch, the, the, the crown, that asked him not to do it, to, to pull it back. I think that's what happened. And, but I, although I did not support Louise in the beginning, I said, guys, if the man wants one year to become governor general, give him a year because we have five years. And George continued the nonsense to the point where he showed me a letter that he had written to the Voice newspaper to be published telling the world that Louise would go and he would become prime minister. I said, George, you wrote that letter? And, and you sent it to... Yep. I mean, what came to my mind to tell George that day? You know, I had too much respect for him, and I'm remembering George from my days as a little boy at St. Mary's College. I said, but only a buffoon, a total jackass <laughs> would do a thing like that. I said, but how can you do that? And you're sending it to the voice, knowing the Gordon family, what they stand for. And, oh, but but my, there came a time... And, and that is where the government, one Lucy got that. Compton started supporting Wizzy. Everybody started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lisa, there came a time, though, when, when Peter was so disgusted with the whole power st struggle and the, the, the repercussions and everything. He went on vacation in New York. And George wrote to him, Peter, mm -hmm. go ahead, tell the story. I don't want me to say it. No, Barry August was there at the time representing us, and Barry, I went to see Barry just to say hello, pay my respects. And he said, George said to come back home right away. And he threw it a struggle. And, and, the power and, struggle. And, and I said to Barry, you know, I have supported George all along, man. I can't continue to do that. This is not politics. That is nonsense you are doing in the name of politics. And soon afterwards, the, 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 the U.S. government invited me, to, invited me through the same Charlie Shelton whom he was having dinner, whom George was having regular dinners with at, <laughs> at, at, at Chef Harry, to be a guest of the U.S. government in a program called United States International Visitors Program. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it was for a month or for six weeks. I'm sorry I didn't take the six weeks. The U.S. <laughs> government took you wherever you want to go, showed you wherever <laughs> you want to see, learn the country, because that program was made, was, was created to train young people in the third world that the American government feel would evolve one day into the leaders of their country. So they wanted you to have a good image of America. But all of these things... I'm telling you, man. You know. um, Lisa, what didn't come out of that was, while Peter was in New York, George wrote to Peter, telling him... He wrote to Barry O'Gis. No, he wrote to you. He ca called you, or, or wrote to you, whatever it was. And promising him he was through, he was going to accept Louis as prime minister, come back. Josie came back, and within two weeks, it had flared up again. And that's yeah. where everything went haywire. So I couldn't, I couldn't continue supporting George, and I told May him so. You know, I could not, in good conscience. And you because had to break the people that of Saint twin Lucia, bond. Yeah, the people of St. Lucia who supported us so much, man. Say, but you were telling the people about horizontal government. Um, there would be no <laughs> leader from forum to now. And all of a sudden, you feel... 
So one day we had an indoor meeting again of, of the elected members, of the ministers. When the matter came up, Luisi um, played a card, a good domino player Luisi was. He said, but Brother George, if I were to go up to government house as governor general, how do you know that you were the one the other 11 members, or even myself, the 12 of us, how do you know that you would be the one elected to, to replace me? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness, Lisa. George could not answer. And that time, Louise is looking at me, you know, as if to direct everybody's attention towards me. That was a, a, a dirty little game. As if to say, well, how do you know it is not going to be Peter? As a matter of fact, when he left, you know, I had almost all the votes except that he pulled out Remy Lesmo, took Remy Lesmo on a yacht with him to get in Francis right. Michel, somewhere to Martinique to go and drink I some wine. And, and, and Winston Snack emerged as, <laughs> as prime minister. As prime minister. Again, it but was Lisa, you, you, it was get, you get the feeling it. of the comedy. You get the feeling of the comedy that I talked about earlier and how people have paid through the years in the Caribbean mm -hmm. for these comedies by the, these politicians. Listen to, listen to what Peter is saying. This, it sounds so petty. It's on the, on, on the hand deals within the party and whatnot that nobody knows about. Uh, it sounds like, like, like a bunch of very uneducated, primitive people. But the lives of people depended on the decisions that came out of those comedic sessions. I want to play, I don't know if we have the time. Yeah, just before we, you go, we, just we have to, we have just to take before a you go, short break. Let me say, we, even in civilized societies, you know, yeah. there's that kind of politics. So but be, they can be afford mind, to. Be mindful. Yeah, but they're, but they're a little more, it's a little more meaty. You know, like Trump and, the, and, and these people. You that's, know. What, that's what you say. Large I, shoulders I, I don't think back on. I don't think it's as petty as, as, as ours, ever. But, that's but what, we, want, we want to take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue the discussion. So let's take a very quick break and we're back with the discussion. It's getting warm. It's HAIR, the Bio-Intelligence bio button, an innovation to the Ministry of Health's approach in battling COVID-19. The bio button is a state-of-the-art device. It supports people keeping regular checks of signs of possible COVID-19 infection while placed in home quarantine. It monitors temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate. It is very simple. Just link it to your smartphone and place the button on your chest. It's that easy. The bio button costs only 100 US for the 14 day period. For further information, please contact the Epidemiology Unit at 468 5325 or 468 5324. Thank you for staying with us and we continue the discussion. Were you there? A look back at the fight for independence in observance of St. Lucia's 42nd anniversary of independence in Syria with me, Rick Wayne and Peter Josie. Before we went to break, very quickly, we're running low on time. We want to get to a lot of other things, but you had a point that you wanted to make, Rick. Yeah. Um, based on what Peter was talking about, the relationship between George and, and Peter, that's a very important relationship. And uh, there is something... I, I, in my book that um, I came out here to, to, at the end of writing the book to, to do a Q&A with George Adlam right after the 82 elections, which was a debacle for, uh, okay, he won everything. And among the questions I asked him, some very interesting questions, by that time, of course, Peter Josie and George had fallen way apart. How do you feel having found yourself at war with, with Josie, hearing him say you brought arms illegally into the country? And his answer, it just made me sick. I felt, first of all, that all of it was Josie playing politics. For example, he used the passport issue, uh, St. Lucians have to check their history, to say I had an arrangement with a gun runner to bring arms into St. Lucia. Josie was being a political animal. He had no finesse or prestige. His harangues on the radio, those nightly harangues in Patois, were conceived to destroy me in the rural areas, my base. He kept saying that I was really a bourgeois because we used to be up at a house at Cap uh, Estate eating lobster. 
He probably didn't understand the religious temper of our people. They, f <laughs> they figured that if you were together eat, enjoying lobster and champagne, why talk about it now? I had pinned the Judas thing on him. He sounded like a traitor spilling. I knew he was killing himself. Josie was playing a kind of politics I won't play. I would not just make up a story and pin it on a man. I never fought Josie with the gloves off. I never had the heart for it. I would go after him with an article, put a little heat on him, that's all. I actually fought back with only three articles. So I say, well, what about that article in The Voice that described you as a sort of Jim Jones? He says, I never had proof that Josie was behind it. If he was, then he must have had outside input. There were people helping him out. Uh, I, I, uh, there's a, there, but go ahead, there's, there's another... So le let me ask Josie then, that breakup of that twin bond, looking back, Peter, do you feel that you had been duped all along? Hmm. Hmm. No, the way I put it, and I, I'm not even sure that I remember where that quote came from, I have felt a long time, Lisa, that I am a man more sinned against than sinning. There are people who from day one always feared me because I was like the lion of Judah in St. Lucian politics. I was fearless. I was like the diamond in the star, the hardest of the hearts. And it was easier to go to an Oxford graduate whom they feel or felt at the time had command of the English language. Had more finesse. More finesse, as they, as they like to put it, right? But you know, you can have finesse on a public platform, but none at all on a one-on-one -on -one after dark, depending on who the female is. But we'll not go into that. <coughs> but what I can say is this. People, and including Rick, including Rick, and I've asked Rick that question. I will not ask it again, but I'll just tell you the question I asked him a long time ago. How come, Rick, that you went to interview George to get a, a Q&A with George? I was deeply involved. Why not me? I think I knew sufficient English at the time to be able to <laughs> give you an interview, right? But even Rick at that time, I must say, and it's, it's past tense, but I have to tell you, at the time I felt was taken up with, with George Oxonian nonsense. Even though he was smart enough, and that is Rick again, was smart enough to check the quotations and to correct him and to realize, <laughs> boy, George is throwing things. And one of them I remember quite well was when the children at St. Joseph's Convent were asked to march against yeah, um, that's the, the same. <laughs> Thomas Gray. Uh, against the, the, the education bill. And I remember you corrected him. Now, that's a long yes. time ago. Yeah. That must have been 71 or 72 yeah. or something. So. so, I don't have much to say on that, Lisa. I have come with clean gloves. People have looked at me. And one of the things I'm so happy about, and it's difficult for people to believe at that age. And I've been in, living in Cassius and now at Grosely, Bonta, different parts of the island in the north for years and years and years. Up to today, I thank God that I was born in Viewfort. That only because there was only one secondary school on the island, and my father insisted that I have to try to get to St. Mary's College, and I thank God for him too. At the time, I, I didn't think, I was not very enthusiastic. But coming, from, coming from Viewfort, I've always been able to look at castries like a foreigner might look at it. And I'm always very happy to look at Viewfort as a person like from, like Cass, from Cassius may be able to look at Viewport. Let's so that, that helped me a lot in my politics. Let's take a look at what eventually emerged, uh, Rick, pardon, um, Plywood City, um, this debacle post um, the elections, and Sir John, um, what, what started it all, Sir John and his thank you rally in, in the William Peter Boulevard. Uh, that era, for St. Lucia, and, and Rick mentioned it earlier, is like our 9-11 sort of situation. Um, let's delve a little deeper into that. W would any one of you know that if Sir John knew that th having his thank you rally in Castries 
as opposed to his Miku base, would have presented some form of threat? I don't think it entered John Compton's mind that, um, you see, Compton was convinced, he, was, he had every reason to be convinced that he was something of a deity, yeah? And, and, and um, what had happened was that Josie and, and George had punctured that, but Compton would not, he said it was hijacked. So he probably still believed that he was still the Compton before that election. And uh, he, he, the party applied for, for permission um, for, for meeting. The Public Order Act requires that the police commissioner, at his own discretion, determine whether to give or not. Not to go and ask anybody. Because it's only the police will know, do they have enough people, enough men? Mm -hmm. What is the state on the ground, and et cetera, et cetera. And that police commissioner, to show you how messed up things were, decided to call George Adlam and not Alan Luigi to, have, to ask, a, should he give him a permit? And George and said, George sure. Said yes. And then he went on a program, an early morning program, to tell the whole of St. Lucia that Compton had applied, the party had applied for a thing, and he was not going to behave like they did and withhold permission and whatever. He knows that um, the ground is not right for Compton. The people still are disgusted with him. And to be fair, a lot of things went on in that campaign that would really antagonize people. The police were free with tear gas every day. The arrest, the, oh, all kinds of things were going on. And, um, but, he, but he stirred that pot. It's like the Mark Anthony thing, you know? You know? So are they all honorable men and all that kind of stuff. He stirred that pot nicely. And what happened, again, I want to, I, want to I, I can't stop saying it. Peter Jody had absolutely nothing. We talked about it earlier. Had nothing to do with this. So, Peter, you were nowhere near. No, but, but more than that, I, I knew what was going on would cause us to lose um, the government and to lose the, the next elections. But let me say something. Um, what Rick just said there, uh, I think that's the first thing to, to, to tonight that I'm going to disagree with him and disagree very strongly. The same way that Alan Luisi had said to Rick, even before the elections, Rick, we are going to win the elections, but we're not going to keep the government. Lisa, you may not understand it even now that you're a grown woman. St. Lucia was such a hot potato for the colonial mm -hmm. people, for the Americans, for the French, for everybody. And Odlum and Josie were menaces. These guys from the colonial office to the American CIA, the American, whatever you want to call them, these guys had made up their minds that whatever government the two of us were in would not last. And I don't believe that Compton, uh, uh, Compton's application for a meeting was by accident. I think Compton was coached, was advised to do that. And I think they knew at the time that George would be arrogant and stupid enough to say yes, go ahead. And George knew that there would be trouble. He knew that. It's not about, oh, being democratic, that Compton would not do it. And that is baloney. You are the government now. You have the safety of the country in your hands for the first time. And the safety of the people and the country is the first law in politics. If you know that there is going to be trouble, Compton could not have held a proper meeting on the boulevard before the elections. You think it's now the people are breathing a sigh of confidence, they feel, boy, now we can do something with our country, or we don't want to come. To now you're going to call it um, a, a meeting on the boulevard? But let me so, agree. So let me that agree. That orchestration, but let me agree that human feces, uh, the throwing of, of, of all of that. Let me agree. Know, let, when let, when let, that happened, Rick knows I was going to drop my wife and, and, uh, not, and they, all the way to Canada. View fort. And I, had, I was in Viewfort. Rick? Um, the earlier part of what Peter said about the CIA, I'm not going to touch that. Mm -hmm. That's speculation, and I don't have any evidence of that. But, but if Peter knew that, then I would imagine that George knew that too. George knew. He knew. Okay. So if he knows the CIA has set up for chaos in the boulevard, and et cetera, and so the break up the government, why would he go along with it? And because I know he wanted to be a Morris bishop. He ah, wanted a revolution. We don't have time for that one, but he's right. <laughs> we don't have time for that one. Um, so anyway... I just want to read one little thing, Lisa. I know time mm -hmm. is set. I asked George after the 82 elections if he had any regrets of the things that had led and, and now he's, uh, he's in the doldrums. So I said, any regrets? And he said, yes, one. 
I should probably have spent more time dealing with Josie and keeping him in line. I started out knowing that Josie had a basic weakness as a revolutionary, a kind of lack of humanity, a lack of ordinary concern for people. He would do political things in camaraderie, but I feel Josie would be driving along and he'd stop the car and say, Mervyn, Mervyn, I don't know who Mervyn is, huh? <laughs> Mervyn, Mervyn, wait for, here for me. Don't move. Don't move, him, boy. It's important. Wait here for me. And Josie would drive off. Mervyn would stay in that place for three hours because he figured that a political directive had been given him. Wait there. Meanwhile, Josie gone in a rum shop. He drinking in there. That was... That, th that is the relationship that most of St. Lucia believes was ironclad. And because Josie still, I, I want to say that in his presence, Josie still reveres George Ardemy in my mind. There are a lot of things Josie could say to elaborate on what has been written. He doesn't even touch it. He said a lot on, on, uh, this afternoon. He said a lot. Mm -hmm. But I know there's a lot more he could have. And he alone can explain why he is so protective of George Adam's contributions to the history. But because, Rick, let me say something to you. I've said that to you years ago. You asked me why was I not writing the truth as I knew it about George. I think George had just passed, actually. And I said to you, I will not do it because he's not there to answer. But he was there we, at the time. We are two different people, Rick. I believe I'm a person of integrity, whatever people may wish to say about me. I would never say anything about what you just read except that George is a liar. <laughs> Mervyn was one of the guys whom I trusted the most to have a drink with me. And there is nowhere I could go that <laughs> Mervyn would not be Who invited. Was Mervyn was a guy, uh, Mervyn Johnson was from um, Marsha. Um, okay. Uh, you know, just living uh, just above me there. Very popular yeah. guy, very strong yeah. guy. Okay. He's since passed, eh? he, he's since died. And I would never, never do that to, to anybody, especially to Mervyn. Were you involved with the, the Archbishop meeting on South Peter? Which one? The, 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 when, um, Memorial Bishop The agreement that George, at uh, Mikey Pilgrim should, um, hold on. Were you involved in the negotiation? Oh, no, no. By that time, George and I had gone our separate ways. In correct. fact, that is That's, why. That is correct. He had Mikey as if Mikey yeah. was a replacement for Peter Joseph. Yes, yes, yes. You know? No, no, I was. So, he, so he, that wasn't, he wasn't too kind to Mikey Pilgrim either in the book when it, when Because I asked Mikey him. would not do the things that I would have done. Okay. <laughs> but we had a hurricane in, um, Hurricane Allen in 1980. Uh, so the Louisi um, was replaced by Prime Minister Winston Snack. That happened in 1981. The SLP had a, a series of strikes, and Snack agreed to step uh, to stand down. With Mike, Michael Pilgrim of the Progressive Labour Party briefly serving as acting Prime Minister until the 1982 Senusian general elections, and that election in 82, which was held on the 3rd of May, was won by the UWP under John Compton. And the UWP won 14 out of the 17 seats. And the voter turnout then was 65.8%. Just some facts there. He won how many viewers. seats? There were 14, 14. out of 14 the 17. 14. So it was 14-3 yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in, in the parliament. Yeah. So that 92 elections, I was asking, so what happened? 82, you um, mean. Yeah, the 82 elections. So what happened? Plywood City, you believe that sort of really set the trajectory for Sir John's return. It also gave the lie, the percentage turnout also gave the lie to the 79 elections, where they had 68% turnout, and Sir John said people were so afraid they didn't turn out. This time, the people were supposed to turn out to vote for UWP, and only 65% turn out. <laughs> so when we are reading and thinking and doing it properly, and doing it scientifically, these things are important. By the way, that, this, this was, it was predictable, Alicia. There had been nothing but trouble with the, with the Labour Party uh, struggle, all kinds of problems, chaos. We don't have time to go into the details. But it was an absolute mess to the extent that, that um, Luigi had resigned when his budget failed. S and Winston Snack, who, 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 who replaced him, um, things didn't get much better. And there was a, 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 a meeting involving Compton, uh, the Archbishop, um, 
And George had formed his own party then. And George, huh? yeah, had formed his own party. And George was merely the, really the big instigator of all of that. It culminated in an agreement that Mikey Pilgrim would, be, would hold on as prime minister and take the country into elections, I think, six months later. But in all that time, it's, it's like chaos. But uh, did that time period do dealt a very uh, a big disservice to the country? Of course not. I, I believe, and that, that's a personal belief, I believe St. Lucia took a turn for the worse and has not turned around since the Boulevard, what I, what I call the Boulevard Explosion, which is all part and parcel of that same thing you, you're talking about, about the, prior to the um, 82 elections. There was trouble almost from the time the Labour Party got into office in 79, right through 82. That's why I tell you, it's called 7982. Mm -hmm. A total, <laughs> my, as I, I started off, the, the, a rebellion against itself. You see, With too many ambitions. I, I don't go into those, you need a psychologist for that. I just go, I'm more pragmatic, I'm, I'm, I know what happened in terms of people, I, I don't know their motivations. But I think, Rick, without cutting you, I think the St. Lucians made the turn and recovered themselves that is, that is what I think in 1997 when they returned the Labour Party 61. Oh, yes. yes. that, that was revenge that for is all true. the things that they have suffered. They, they gave Dr. Anthony everything yeah. that they asked for. They had banana yes, people yeah. who were prepared to cut each other. I think Kenny and Anthony had the perfect, he was the guy who was going to all of the Take ills, care of all those ills. All of the ills that had visited and, us, and all the all mistakes that, that were made. The people of St. Lucia, especially those who supported the Labour Party. I ran against Kenny Anthony at Viewport in 97. And I know strong UWPs who voted for Dr. Anthony in Viewport. Oh, it was not a, And a, throughout a, the he, island. But he could not have won 7 16 one without a without lot of UWP votes. And, so the and, whole country came together. But, but, to I, but I would still say that that Boulevard thing was about the worst that happened. What happened to follow up that was that further disappointment because it was expected perhaps too much of Kenny yeah. because he now had this mess to deal with and to a large extent he brought some major discipline to the Labour Party as a party. Mm -hmm. But um, we're not discussing Kenny Anthony today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but um, he, he, it was a big, it was a big job to, to bring people Back to, back to what? I thought the Labour uh, Party. You know, you, you ask yourself, back to what was he supposed to bring him back to? The, you couldn't bring him back to the time of Compton because that was a problem. Mm -hmm. So he had to be middle of the road. He had to instill in people the confidence that they could do things themselves. But it's not an easy job, at least I have to say that as well. And I'm glad for the opportunity to say that. Being the prime minister, being a politician, a prime minister in St. Lucia is no easy job. St. Lucia is a poor country, very little resources. People have all kinds of ambitions that have nothing to do with St. Lucian reality, and you're supposed to deliver. So you pander, and you become like the monster you're fighting. So it's not an easy job at all. So I, I, think, I, I need I think to ask about the relationship be between, sorry, Peter, I need to ask about the relationship between Sir John and uh, George Odlum. Um, because later on, we would see the, the two of them having the alliance political party. Um, <laughs> Rick, I, perhaps, and, and perhaps you to Peter, would give us a, an idea as to was there ever a relationship between George Odlum and, and John Compton? And, and um, what exactly was that relationship? I think every, po every po politician in Lucia the Higher Ashland once wanted to be John Compton. I think Kenny, in his heart of hearts, wanted to be a John Compton. George Adler, in his heart of hearts, wanted to be a John Compton. Because Compton set the mold. Compton was a deity for most of his time. I will never know what Compton's motive. I used to be his personal assistant and very close to him on a personal level. And, but I can't answer that question. I know for a fact that he, when George was dead, he, gave job, he, gave, he sent George to the UN. I am finding out now that there was never any of the, of the usual process, Peter, of um, your papers to the Governor General and so on. I don't think that ever occurred. So it seems that George simply went and took over the job as UN ambassador. And 
ostensibly, I have no proof of that, Compton had promised George that come a time he would run, uh, he, would, he would be prime minister to follow. But of course we know what happened. Mm -hmm. Vaughan Lewis was the guy Compton chose. And you will note, you will remember also George quit his job at, at the UN to come fight Vaughan Lewis, convinced he was going to win and Vaughan, um, Vaughan, Vaughan beat him. So I don't know, but it, is, it was definitely a charitable move to rescue George, as Compton said, from a Choiselle rum shop over there. So, I don't know. I but let me say something quickly before you go to break. You ask about George and Compton. Mm -hmm. Staffy, George's father, had, together with Mr. Morissette, on, who was on Bridge Street, and Staffy was on, on St. Louis Street, the two leading barber shops in St. Lucia at the time. Almost everybody went to either Staffy or Morissette. George was well known as his father's son, who was fairly bright, and the boy at St. Mary's College, etc. And George told me, he used to have conversations with Compton when he was as young as 19 years old. So Compton and George knew each other. And George always put acting and literature before politics. When this little um, ammunition, not um, the guns, I, I forgot the name, a barata, when the little baratas had arrived in St. Lucia, George told me he actually took one at, to Compton's home and Sir Mitchell, the, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent at the time, who is cousin to Compton, were there. And maybe they had a little gathering for, for son Mitchell. George took the thing and called Compton <laughs> in, a, you know, in a private thing, either in his bedroom or what, and showed him, this is a guy you're trying to fight, you don't like him. You so George was always a joker, a, a fellow, an impressionist giving people the impression that he was a revolutionary and thing and, and all the things he said about me is more true about himself. You but, know, I don't like that? to say these things. That was a papi show. That's part right. of the history. That, uh, that's part of history, that, but that was a papi show thing. So what you taking this thing for, to show Compton for? L let's hear from Sir John. As we go to break, we'll play the clip of ah. Sir John speaking on uh, the Alliance a Political Party with George Odlum. And the talk about the alliance, the, we, I thought it was a great idea. I still think it was a great idea. But you have people with personalities. You, when, you deal, when you're having an alliance, you have to deal with people. And it couldn't work. As I, if we want to personalize the thing, I would work with George. But I would not work under George. I made it very clear. I would work with him. My relationship with him was something that people don't understand. My personal relationship with him never diminished. I mean, he, I knew that he had certain ambitions and I was in his way. And he did certain things that I f felt offended by. But it never never really affected the relationship that I had with him from boyhood. But when it came for us to work, we worked together. But I wouldn't work under him. So, because look, I mean, it's not power I'm craving. I've been prime minister for all these years. Now I'm going to come to work in a subordinate role. I would not do it. So because of that, it's the alliance broke up. That was it. It was not no more than that. If we had worked out something, uh, uh, a real alliance between us, the alliance between us did not come. You could not see how it could work. So, and the, we were the major players in the alliance. And once we parted, it went. Cet min corona ek ika fe movement ek an chai vitesse tan chak kanef ka kouye pou vilijans publik la fe wolo pale an plas publik kon bol an me baz ti boutik chonje distan social sis pie hod yon alot ika twa vaitan Si ou santi kou pa kodyal, 
quarantine call. Part where you contact a pilot and count it to be exposed. Si you have a free 311 or be Nepot Clinic, you can pay. The pay is 10 million. The savle di the supermarket, the pharmacy, the PATM, you are accessible avant to get it. The pay is clé en plein. Ça veut dire tout bagay fermé à 24 heures. C'est vi protocole comme sorti par bureau indication santé. Nous tout ensemble ça sauver vers min corona. Si nous tout servi jid là à toutes les. Were you there? A look back at the fight for independence. That's our discussion. And at the panel table, Rick Wayne and Peter Josie. Uh, so we heard just going to break. So John speaking about the relationship with George Odlam, as well as the alliance. I know you had a lot to say, Rick, at the time that the alliance was formed. Um, what are your thoughts now looking back? I should first want to address what the, what the Prime Minister just said. I was at my house. For, uh, one Prime Minister Compton. Hmm? Former Prime Minister Compton. Yeah. I was at my house one day, and two prominent gentlemen came to see me. And they gave me the whole story of what they planned with the alliance and so on. And they wanted me to come to a certain address to have a discussion with them and with Morella Joseph, mm -hmm. George Adlam, and, um, John Compton. and Sir John. And they were talking and talking and talking. I, I put it straight. I said, well, who is the leader of this group? Because they were planning a meeting, public meeting, two or three days later. Who is in this group? And Compton says, well, it, it, it will just emerge. George Adlam would not commit himself. And Morella Joseph, who I think was one of the most underestimated politicians in this country, and I can't speak too highly of her. I thought the UWP crucified her, the UWP of the day crucified her. These were people like Joe, um, um, oh man, Busquet, um, Rufus. Lawson Calden was, I think Lawson Calden worked with her and so on. But the UWP back in that time, the last thing they would even imagine is having a woman lead them. It was so bad that when Morello was on the platform, most of the guys would leave the platform, step off the platform. That's how bad it was. They totally underestimated her. I think the only guy who spoke well of her to me um, was Arsene James. Uh, no, no, was it? Uh, I think it was Arsene James or would it have been Easy Keller? I'm not sure. One of them. I, it, probably more Arsene. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. But I, I thought they treated her very, very, very bad. Now, the alliance thing, uh, Morella interrupted. And she says, if Rick were a gentleman, and you know how much gonads it takes for a woman who's just coming into this, picture it, with these two political giants, and she's almost a non-entity, a school principal a few weeks earlier. And she said, gentlemen, if Rick Wayne cannot understand this three-headed leadership thing. How are we going to spell that out to the people at a public meeting? Neither of them answered. And I will tell you uh, 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 something private as well. That evening, I, they, they, they were appearing on my show, on talk, and Morella came earlier than, than, than the other two. I said to her, Morella, whatever you're doing, don't give up your leadership of the party until etc etc the show was terrible it was a repetition of what had happened at the meeting nobody wanted to say who was going to lead the group etc and shortly after that Morella emerged leader of the United Workers Party now Compton says the real reason was he refused to work under George Adam that's the first time I've heard him articulate that but that was the suspicion anyway. How could Compton go working under George Adler? And George Adler went into the alliance to lead the alliance. At the end of the day, Morella outwitted both of them.
We want to go back to Sir John and hear him speak about um, the leadership struggle and going back to uh, elections uh, in 82. I'm speaking, we got pulled into the Cold War. They saw an opportunity of capturing St. Lucia, but using this new leftist element. Now, the person who stood in their way was Louise. Louise refused to give in. And he had to be pushed aside. So you had this confusion in St. Lucia, with this leadership struggle between the, the new left and the old left, new labor, new labor, etc. And St. Lucia population got caught up in it. But they weren't really involved. It was a little struggle by a small clique of people. Now, it collapsed. The whole thing collapsed and we had to go back into elections in 82, which we won. And we won handsomely. Peter, your recollections at that time? I would not put it the same way that Sir John put it, but that is his prerogative and he's no longer there for, to dispute what I'm saying. The point about it is that I think I've gone through that, I've explained already. It was the time for a new thinking, a new politics, and that Sir John Compton had done everything he had to do for St. Lucia. And in our opinion at the time, only a new thinking and a new um, community of spirit among grassroots people would take us where we had to go. So, I mean, he came back and won in 82, and he won handsomely, and it is our fault. So I don't blame Sir John, I don't blame anybody. And he's correct that there was a leadership struggle. We have all seen that. We have gone through it. Yeah, but it gives and a certain angle mm -hmm. to that leadership scrub, uh, yeah, like, like there was outside interference and so on. There wasn't. Yeah, well, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there was any outside interference. There was strictly ambition with George and, 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 and Luigi. Exactly. So even, even to call leftists and things, so these are labels people put on you. I, I wouldn't be surprised if people still regard me as a leftist for my views. But that being said, I have no regrets about my role in the politics of St. Lucia. If, if I had to do everything over again. Even though an entire government collapsed and did not deliver to the people what was promised. Even, don't put words in my mouth. I'm asking the question. Let me say what I was saying. Even though, if I had to live my life all over again, the only thing I think I might do differently is to dissociate myself from George at an <laughs> earlier time. That's the first thing. And the second thing I would do, and I would advise any young person who thinks that they're ambitious and they're good enough, do not follow anybody and do not be second to anybody. If you're serious and you want to become involved in politics, you make sure you get at the top of the party to control and do the things that you think are necessary. But don't be second fiddle to anybody. And that's one of the regrets I have in my life. What about um, where George has his own version of how he got you to vote against the budget that in fact brought down the government? Because what he, what he said was, that he had to persuade you, and his speech did it. That's in Hansard as well. He, he, he delivered that speech, and um, afterwards, you, you, if that's where you changed your mind. But George was always inflating his, in, his own ego. That was the problem. I told George, and I think I told you so too, I went to have a private chat with Alan Luizzi in the Prime Minister's office. Alan Luizzi and I always spoke well. In fact, I was the one who went to canvas Alan Luizzi when Kenny, George and I went to Kenny's home and wanted Kenny to be a senator, and then Kenny Anthony I'm talking about. I went to Alan Luizzi as Prime Minister. I said, Prime Minister, I would like you to tell me what would, be, what would your cabinet look like if you won that vote of confidence in the budget. He couldn't answer me. He couldn't say, but I know, I said, but you know, we have been campaigning and canvassing against you remaining as prime minister, okay? So tell me, if I voted for you, for example, or if the others voted for you 
and you survived, what would the new government, your new cabinet look like or would you reshape it? That is something every person who follows politics would like to know. Why was there a need for a new budget, for a new cabinet? Because I'm, I'm saying because there that, was, that was the budget we're talking about. I'm a yeah, but if your budget fails, that means you have failed. And if, if you succeeded, if you succeeded and you had ministers not supporting you, oh. mm. you understand? Mm -hmm. So you had to do something about it, but Alan could not answer me. And that time I said to myself, you know, this guy is really weak. I really can't support him. It had nothing to do with what George said. Well, you know what that, George what was more afraid of me than anything else because George knows my views and what I was capable of doing. Because it, it was it just, just a time like that in the Caribbean, not only in St. Lucia. Okay? But, but, but aren't, you, aren't you concerned with what's in Hansard about this particular episode? Because he says he, uh, uh, the whole story of how he persuaded you by his oratory and whatever to... Um, but that would not be recorded in Hansard like that, you know. They'd probably record what he says, what, just what he said. Oh, but he said that in, 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 in the parliament. Because he, he, he was talking about, the, I forget the, the topic, but that is in Hansard about how he persuaded you uh, um, to, 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 to... To vote against the budget. Yeah. But, but you know, there was and a and lot... And he couldn't persuade me to continue serving with him as if I was a little boy, though. All huh? right. You know, there was a lot <laughs> then post the... the so, 79, 82. Coming out of that, um, there was a St. Lucia that needed healing. And so John spoke uh, about building back the country uh, afterwards. So let's hear him speak about that. We had to start to rebuild. We had to start to rebuild in 82. And as a person was there, it took me three years before we got up at the bottom, before we started to move. People didn't know the trouble we had. But we had help again because of the Cold War. The Americans were very happy to see those guys go. So they came and gave us assistance, gave us financial assistance to start rebuilding. The Canadians helped us, the British helped us, because they didn't want us to go the way of Grenada. Remember, within 21 days of of St. Lucia's elections. We were on the 22nd of February. On the 13th of March, there was the Grenada Revolution. So we got caught up in that. We got caught up in, in this. That is how St. Lucia became. That is why, you know, after the, the elections, then there was the, uh, the Grenada Revolution and all this confusion. In then, as soon as we returned, by 83, the intervention in Grenada. Again, we got sucked in to external politics. And we had to fight our way and confine ourselves rather than being drawn by it. Well, the so first, mistake, the the first about mistake the difficulties. there is that, as I recall, Peter, Grenada was a year Grenada before. Grenada uh, preceded, preceded our yeah, election. Yeah. But it had, a, it had impact. But it preceded our elections. And so do you believe that the Grenada set the stage for where we would have been? Yeah. Um, right. So, so John is right in that way that no, perhaps said the he, Americans no, no, had no, he their eyes. He, but yeah, he, he, conf he uh, confused himself there because he said both. Grenada was in October of the year before. Yeah. And the in Americans, 81. and as I said earlier, I have no written proof, but I know the Americans had a say in what was going on because these guys did not want to see Maurice Bishop's friends or anybody related to what we call progressive. And they were concerned about their own black societies. When you have progressive people in the Caribbean leading and talking the kind of politics we're talking at the time, if that got to the black Americans, they would rise up mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. But they had the black power movement. Yeah, but, but guess what? They never converted it into political power. <laughs> That's another story. So now that we are 42 years past later in our independence, 
Are there new actors replaying old roles? Can you see that as you look at our political landscape? Are there uh, glimpses of, of, of what that time period would have um, meant for us? Are we seeing that at all emerging at this time? I don't see anything emerging, Lisa. And I'll be honest with you, the work was hard. What I see now is everybody trying to use television, using social media, using this. But in those days of Ordnum, myself, as Rick would tell you, we were on the platforms morning, noon, and night, sweating it out. And it was hard work. Five years straight. Getting, yeah, getting to the various nooks and crannies of St. Lucia, the constituencies and things. Right now, I believe there's an attitude in St. Lucia today that if you play with social media on Facebook and things, so you can use that to campaign, sit at your home as an armchair politician, and hopefully win an election. But I don't think there's anybody in St. Lucia that I can think of, either in the UWP, the Labour Party, or no, no party, who is prepared to come and say, listen, I'm mounting a platform, whether I stand alone at a street corner, launch a party with two other guys, and to say, do what we're going to do, say what we, we intend to do, the name of the party. I don't see anybody in St. Lucia. I wish I was wrong about this. Right now, you know, there's a nice Creole phrase, you know, when people want things without working for it. You know, they, they, they don't want to plant the food. They don't want to go and harvest it. They don't want to put it on fire and cook it. But once it's ready, they'll be the first at the table. That is the attitude I see in St. Lucia right now among people who pretend that they want to be in politics. So Rick, any, are you seeing history repeating itself in any way 42 years later? The very, very sad situation in St. Lucia is the musical chairs thing. It's as if there are no possibilities out there. The politicians, the Labour Party, for example, I mean, does somebody expect that if the Labour Party should win the election, that there would be positive change and people would suddenly get ideas that they didn't have all those years? Maybe. But that would be a, a miracle. We have a, a prime minister right now who from the start tells you he's, he's, he's speaking outside the box. In fact, from the very beginning, he stated, I will not be like what's gone before. And I th supported that. I support that on the basis that what went on before obviously has failed us miserably in every way. Our people could not be more polarized than we are right now. Um, for you to be powerful, you must be together. We can get together on nothing, not even on, on COVID. We, 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 we can't wait to count the deaths and, and, all, and everything wrong with the CMO. Or, there's, a, there's this cut across. There's, a, there's a, 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 a war going on between the government and the opposition, even on a life and death matter like COVID. And when I say the government and the, and the opposition, I'm talking about the Sinisha population. So the population is at war with itself yet again in a life and death matter. Okay? So the, the, the future, I don't even know what the future is. Because the politicians are not, have not allowed themselves even to think of the reality of the fallout of COVID now. Let alone, if there is such a thing as post-COVID, what post-COVID means. So, as I, I was saying earlier, it's like a, the whole thing has been a very expensive comedy from 79, and a, a very expensive comedy. The same victims, the same, uh, and these are the poorest people in the country, over and over, politicians come in and use the poorest people in the country to get into office. Bananas, I'm going to have such a story again, the same people. Because people, very few of those people who were down there, so to speak, are up there now. We, we have a, a, a growing, rebellious, poor people going on for a lot of some reasons that have nothing to do with St. Lucia, by the way. But how do you look forward to a future when you don't know what the future is? You have no idea what the future is going to be. So all you can do now is look at past performance. And you now want an adventurer, a guy who's going to take chances 
a guy who shows he, he thinks not always right because when you think when you act outside the box th there's a saying that only those who do nothing will not make mistakes so that's the balance that St. Lucia now has to stretch so I don't think anybody can predict a future for the country they can they can say how they feel it ought to go and how people ought to think but I don't think anybody can tell you this is the future yeah, of the country. Yeah, so what Rick, future Rick, did Rick, you Rick. envisage uh, for St. Lucia Peter I am happy to be here today because it's 42 years and I thank God first that I've lived to be able to say how I felt and how I still feel about certain matters. As everybody knows, I was literally shown the door of the Labour Party by Mr. Hunt, Julian Hunt, when he became leader. The people at Viewport South that day in 1992 from Labry Boys School invited me to come with them. Let's go and get Mr. Girodi and Mr. Compton right now. We're joining the, the, the UWP. I said no. Eventually, I took my stand and I joined when Vaughan Lewis invited me to work with him as minister in the Minister of Agriculture. I have no regrets about this thing. What I see right now is for us to pray, to pray that young people, both men and women, will rise with their education and be committed sufficiently to see St. Lucia prosper economically and socially and come and take their place among political people that are serious about politics. We have to live our future and the prosperity of our people and our country in the hands of people who are determined to make a contribution to a positive St. Lucia. Thank you so much for that. And our time has indeed wrapped up. I want to thank you for participating and for you, um, our viewers, uh, for staying tuned and listening to Were You There? A look back at the fight for independence, not just from the people who lived through that era of 1979 to 1982, but they were actually integral players in that time period. I am Lisa Joseph. Thank you so much for joining us once again. And as we close, we leave you with Sir John in his own words. Our problem with independence started from 78, when the, the negotiations with, and the confusion, local confusion, the, I, I'm speaking about the assistance with the British government representative, the Latoc, Eric Latoc, I must mention his name. You remember when they went and the, the other one came in, they went to Malabar and smashed it up, and the confusion, the planning, to take over by force because the if we had I always say that looking back is a good thing we'd lost those elections because they had the plan well made to take over by force.